Could everyone uh, make their way to their uh, chairs? We'll try to get this thing started on time, even though we're a minute late. It says 6.01 over here on my, on my Verizon phone. Is anybody seen Chatham, heard from him? Hopefully he'll be here shortly. Uh, okay. What I just do with this document. Yes, we have a preacher. Before we get started, I just a friendly reminder that if you um, have anything that you want to talk about that's on the agenda tonight, fill out a blue card. Ray has them. If there's anything that you would like to speak about that is important to you that's not on the agenda, fill out a yellow card. And um, you'll have plenty of opportunity to um, share your concerns and your thoughts uh, during the public hearing process. Um, I'm going to go ahead and call tonight's meeting to order. And we have Pastor Steve Ferris of First Baptist Church to lead us in the invocation. Could everyone please stand? Father, we just come before you acknowledging you as Almighty God and giving you thanks 
for you've blessed this nation immensely. You've blessed us immensely. And Father, we just come asking your help. And Lord, as the scripture says, if our people will humble themselves and pray and seek your face, then we'll hear from heaven and heal our land. And Lord, uh, this country is in disunity right now, and we desperately need your help. And Lord, I pray for this council tonight. I know they're seeking leadership. And Lord, as uh, many times as the leadership goes, so does the, the country. And in this case, so does the city. And Lord, I pray that you will give them wisdom as the, they deal with all the affairs they have to, and especially the new city manager that they'll be looking to appoint. Father, we just uh, give you praise and honor for who you are. And, and Lord, we understand we can do nothing without you. Therefore, we ask your wisdom again and your knowledge in Jesus' name. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item is the general approval. Does any council members have anything that they would like to change? Mr. Braden, I see you bobbing your head over there. <laughs> yes, Mayor. Um, I'd like to pull uh, item 2A off tonight's agenda and put it on the next meeting. Um, this packet was just dropped in front of us as you was calling the meeting to order, and I don't have time to look over it. Um, we've already started the meeting. Um, so it, I'd like to pull that up the rest of the council would allow me to. Lance, the items that we just got, they weren't in the package when, when Mr. Uh, Krebs or his representative uh, asked to have a, propo uh, a uh, proposal. They were not, and I'll defer to Ms. Kopp. So what happened was the uh, Mr. Krebs consultant had prepared um, the backup and there were some errors in it and so she needed to make corrections and we just received the corrected versions today but mr krebs is prepared to explain it if you are interested tonight otherwise we can put it off to the next meeting if you think you need more time thank you Ms. cop um council um mr braden wanted to pull this so um at this point we will i guess take a vote whether to yeah, Do we second. have a second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Let's see. Hold on. I didn't. I wasn't supposed to vote, so I should abstain. Ray, can you uh, take me off of there? Because Chatham's here now. I actually abstain, Ray. Let's just reset it. It will revote it. Are we set? There you go, folks. Does Chatham know what he's voting on? Uh, Nose have it, so it'll remain on the agenda. Any other items on the agenda? Any other? Mayor, um, after looking through the packet, and I see on the agenda 4C and 4E, 
Uh, I'd like those to be pulled and agended for our um, Crosstown Connector and Parking Concurrency workshop that we're going to be having uh, this month. Uh, I'm not prepared to, to vote on, on either of those items tonight. What's the, what's the date on that meeting? Yes, do you have that? Good to you. Well, I thought we were going to set a specific workshop independent. I don't know if the date has been set, but we had set a tentative date, I think, somewhere around the last week of October. But if it needs to get kicked to, uh, to the first week of November, I'm comfortable with that. But I'd like those items to be discussed at that time because I'm not, without having that workshop, I'm not prepared to vote on either of those. We, we had tentatively set the, um, the workshop for the 22nd. And um, the, with the expectation um, that if city council um, uh, elected to go with the memorandum of understanding, that we would have uh, multiple engineers involved with, with the, uh, but we can still keep the 22nd. That's the 22nd October? That's correct. Okay. All right, that's my motion. We have a motion. Do I have a second? Can you repeat the motion? Yeah. Motion is to move 4C and 4E to the 22nd of October when we have our uh, parking and traffic concurrency workshop. I'll second that. But you're, you're not going to take any action at that time, right? You're going to take action at the next city council meeting? Correct, after, scheduled after that point. All right, I have, a, <clears throat> I have a motion, I have a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Unanimous eyes have it so moved. Thank you, Mayor. So everyone marked their calendars for October 22nd. Done. All right. Any other agenda items that need to be changed, moved, or discussed before we go further? Seeing none, can I have a motion to approve the agenda? Second. So moved. Second. <clears throat> yes, vote. The vote is unanimous, so moved. Now we're going to move down to item number 1A, approval of the minutes of June 4th, 2018, regular city council meeting. So moved. Second. Seeing any further discussion? Seeing none? Eyes have it, so moved. Next, item 1B, approval of the minutes of the May 21st, 2018 regular city council meeting. So moved. Second. I have a motion, a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, cast a vote. Eyes have it, so moved. And we've moved item, did that pass? We kept two. Okay, we kept. So uh, item 2A, request by Mr. David Krebs for letter of concurrence, 25 foot setback waiver to repairing line. Mr. Krebs, would you like to approach the podium? Mr. Mayor, Council, thank you, good evening. Um, and thank you to Ms. Kopp, who has tried to guide me through this process. I bought the uh, Fuller property, which is at the end of Beach Drive and right next to uh, the Destin, one of Destin's little city parks right there. Uh, the letter of concurrence for setback waiver that I gave you in your packet has the wrong address. They, she thought it was Grand Boulevard Condominium. That was my neighbor, but it's actually the city of Destin. So my request is 
uh, or should I, I'll give you the background of why I bought the property and what my concern is. My life is commercial fishing. That's all I've ever done. That's all I know. I started in 1969 on Dewey Destin's dad's boat. And uh, that's my history. Uh, my family's had the wholesale company. So in Destin, you have two wholesale companies, Harbor Docks and Ariel Seafoods, Ariel being my company. Uh, as Destin continues to grow, we like two things. We like tourists and we like fresh seafood, but we're running out of dock slips. And I bought this property to have a future for my commercial boats to be in Destin Harbor, not to have to move them somewhere else. Um, we're on the east end, out of, out of everybody's view. It's not to do any commercial activity. It is merely to be able to tie these boats up when they're not working. So my request is if you look at the picture, uh, second picture, the existing dock um, that's there ends where the white dots are. You can see where there was boats when they took that picture. So basically right here, there's a little bitty L dock that sits there now. And what we would like to do is mirror that L dock and just extend out, do away with the other docks and put slips that would point to the east. And, and so if we can use a variance on the riparian rights to the city, we wouldn't be putting any activity on that side. We wouldn't be encroaching on the city's riparian rights with boats or anything. It's just you have to, with the new setback rules for DEP, you have to ask for that variance. And so uh, my apologies, uh, the, the girl that did these drawings for me, she went on vacation right after I met with Ms. Kopp and she got back this morning and, and redid the, the drawings of what it would look like. So I think the very last picture shows it in pretty good detail that the, the pier would come out and then there's four slips, four 22 foot slips that would be facing east towards Mr. Eddington's property, which are also historical family friends with with the Morgans and myself and the Gentries. Um, so that's, uh, that's probably my naivety to just show up here and, and plop it on, on Tuffy's desk and everybody's desk and Rodney's to say, here it is, because other than it's a non-event to me, but I'm a little bit uh, easier than all that stuff. So I, I realize what y'all are, are doing, but we don't wanna, we don't run, run a commercial activity there we don't want to do anything but tie up commercial, my commercial boats so they'll have a home in the future. Uh, I am at a tremendous disadvantage right now. Mr. Morgan has the only waterfront seafood dock in, in, in the harbor, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, we, we just want to make sure we have fresh seafood in Destin, that, which continues to set us apart. I mean, I take trucks now as it is and, and have to go to Louisiana and Panama City and all over Florida to pick up fish, but I'd like to be able to pick up my own in Destin as we have forever. So that's, that's my request and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Mr. Dixon. Um, I, I guess um, my question, it would be that, um, and, and I don't know if it's directed towards you, David, or if it's directed towards our city attorney, is that um, are we doing anything to bypass where anybody from the joining property owners could have a say so in this and, and the reason I ask that is that I know that whenever we go through um, uh, you know the, the DP and the Corps of Engineers and everything else that people are given opportunity to at least address it you know the surrounding property owners so actually what you're doing is you are removing the Eddingtons out of the equation so without without the city's approval the, the whole dock shifts further east by 25 feet and then that puts me in the situation of, of asking the Eddingtons for a variance and quite possibly we would still be looking at how we would address boats tying up on the west side of that dock which now we wouldn't use I mean we're still not encroaching on riparian rights of the city but we've certainly moved the whole entire dock back to to the uh, to the west, where we have room going east, where we don't get into the Eddington property at all. Yeah, but you do understand what I'm saying. I, I'm basically asking that that whatever we do here tonight, I want to make sure that we're not cutting out anybody's ability to say something to us and to differ with you know your opinion. No, I'm your neighbor to the east, so uh -huh. they're, they're, you've already dealt with Grand Grand Boulevard condominiums to the west. Well, and, and I guess more what I'm asking is that there's a distance that we utilize when we're doing anything like this. And I don't know if that would apply here, like 
500 feet or whatever close to where property owners are that you would notify them that we're going to do this. And, and I don't know if that is something that we legally need to do or anything. This has to do with repairing rights that are over the water, not, not with shoreside land rights. Yeah, I understand. I so didn't know if there's a difference. And, and, I'll, I'll yeah. defer to Ms. Scott. So this, in this application, well, I use that term loosely because it's not really an application to the city, but, the, uh, but Mr. Krebs is looking for a letter of concurrence from the city because the city owns the adjacent land. Um, so DEP requires that letter of concurrence before they would approve um, this dock to be extended because it encroaches into the city's um, required setback. Not the city requirement, but DEP requirement. Okay. So but... we don't have public hearing requirements or notification requirements uh, on the city's end. Okay, just wanted to check that and make sure. Also, um, you, you know, I know that we are basically, that's a home, right? I mean, that, that is a home. Two homes. Okay, two homes there. Um, we're not going to get into an issue where we're going to start unloading fish from there no, or no, anything like that? Uh, that, you have my word. A, a it's... <clears throat> It's 40 feet of dock, and then it's up a hill like that. You know, in 1995, I looked at buying banana barks, and I looked at that hill, and I said, how would you ever get a fish up that hill? So mm -hmm. we, we abandoned that. No, there will be no commercial activity at all there. All it is is dock tying up boats. Okay. All right, thank you. How, how big a boat will you plan on putting in there? I'm sorry. Well, we know we've got three, and I, I'm asking for four slips because I plan on buying another boat. So it would be four slips. How big are the boats? They're all the the biggest would be 57, so they're they're anywhere from 45 to 57 foot. Mr. Destin. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just so we can continue the discussion in order, I'm I'm going to go ahead, ahead and make a, a motion that we uh, issue a letter of concurrence for the 25 setback, wa uh, setback waiver to the riparian line on behalf of uh, the city for for Mr. Krebs' application. Uh, we got a motion. We have a second. Uh, further discussion. You're still got the mic. I uh, I I understand what they're asking for. Um, it's uh, the dock itself will be slightly into the buffer area that everyone has, and is I understand the public policy behind having these 25 foot setback waivers so everybody can come together and understand exactly, you know, hand in hand. But at the end of the day, Mr. Eddington doesn't appear to be um, impacted by uh, the current setup, and I'm a big proponent of uh, preserving uh, charter and commercial fishing activities on the harbor, so um, you'll have my support. Park, Parker, Mr. Destin, real quick, um, is your motion really to direct the city manager to execute the letter of concurrence? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Destin. Mr. Oberdeer. So the property that we own to the west, I mean, what, what is that property? It's that little park. It's the, it, when, you, when you're at the, oh, um, Lance is the, I won't step on your toes. You go ahead. No, that's all right. It's, it's Harbor View Park, and it, it's got a platform deck that overlooks the harbor. Okay. All right. Got it. You done? Sir. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I did have three people um, ask what it was all about, and... I had no idea. It wasn't on the agenda packet. There was no maps. There was no nothing. They were asking it. Um, I was asked tonight before the meeting even started by someone what this was about. They had no idea. I didn't know anything about it. Um, the, the other individuals that asked me during the week um, wanted to be here, wanted to speak, and I said, well, there's nothing on the agenda. I, I guess we're just hearing something from Mr. Krebs trying to get an idea of what he's wanting, I guess. So th those people never showed up tonight because they were told not to be here. Um, and we had, I know we had discussed in the past of, you know, whenever something is dropped in our lap the night of the meeting that, you know, we didn't do business that way. That's how business has been done in the past and things have been slid through and we didn't have a chance to look at them. Um, I haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, but anyhow, I, I mean, for those reasons alone, I can't support it um, because I did tell people not to be here because there was nothing on the agenda about it, um, and they wanted to, to speak about it. Um, that, and I mean, I, don't, I, I still don't understand what's going on or what this does, um, I, I, and I don't want to get in the habit of giving away 
more of the city's waterfront access, um, repairing rights. We've gotten a big argument about that from the, the Heritage Park we got down there. Um, this city should have had a, a big marina years ago, and we just steadily giving away land and giving away water rights and repairing rights. And um, I don't know, but anyhow, that's all I got to say. Ms. Cop, would you like to further explain what a letter of concurrence is all about? Sure. The setback requirement is from the riparian line in the water. So if Mr. Krebs extends his deck out, it will fall within 25 feet of that line. And so the state requires, since the city is, that, is the owner of that property there, the city to concur. Um, if it had been a private property owner, he would be asking a private property owner for this letter of concurrence. So does that explain better? We're not encroaching on the city's property. No. We're not the taking 20, anything away from the city. Within the 25 feet separation requirement, so to speak. But if we'd ever built anything on that piece of property in the future, you know, wouldn't it's, it be? It's wetlands. You can't build anything there. Wetlands? All right. Uh, Ms. Rams, are you, are you done, Mr. Braden? I'm done. Okay. Ms. Ramswell. So I, I guess how far does the current dock extend? Right where you see the little white dots. So it, it comes out, it's an L dock. And so it's already, it would be grandfathered in the riparian rights of the city. But, okay. but I'm asking to extend the dock so we can add more boat slips to it. So we're not, again, we can rebuild the dock that is there without asking anybody for anything. It's grandfathered in. All I have to do is go reset the pylons and redeck the dock. But it would be more beneficial to me personally as a commercial boat owner to be able to put commercial, my commercial boats down there and, and have them. So we just need to extend that dock out. So when I'm looking at, because I've got the satellite imagery up and I'm looking at the photos you provided as there? well. So um, Can I go over there? The existing dock as it is, does it slant slightly? And is that the issue that the further you slant? So it goes, this is it right here. It just comes right here and makes an L. It comes right there and goes. Right. There. So, but if you extend it out, like you're asking, right. is the line such that it actually goes no, to the line. west? Here's your line the same way. So they're following, this is your repairing lights. Ms. Ramswell, right. could you, Ms. Ramswell, so could you make they sure that Mr. Krebs is speaking thing. into the mic? so that oh. Ray can take good minutes here. So I, what I'm trying to understand is, does the way it is, the way it's situated currently, mm -hmm. is it encroaching upon our riparian rights as is? Yes. yes. Okay, that's, that's what I was trying so to get at. So all we're doing at, is overlaying was... the existing dock that's there and coming out following the same riparian rights that the existing dock has already encroached on. Okay, right. that's what I was trying to get to. Yeah. All right. Um, so then my ne that's yeah. So my next question then is for I guess city staff or manager or council. If we were to look at putting in um, a dock or something of some sort at the Harbor View Park, would that preclude us from doing so? Would we have to then get some sort of waiver or setback, or would we still have enough space to do so? The city has a process uh, that Mr. Trammell here is very familiar with. The Harbor and Waterways Board generally also approves these. And generally, it's the Harbor and Waterways Board's advisory panel. They would kind of um, make a, an advisory decision for the city council, and then the city council would make its own uh, decision. And the Harbor and Waterways Board also has guidelines they follow. So how, far, how wide is our lot there? Does anyone know offhand? Because it's not. Eric, can I try to... Is it a 68, or is it not even 68? No, it's not 68. Uh, I would guess in the 40 range. Okay. So then we would, even if we were centered, if we were centered, we'd have... T no, we wouldn't have 25. We'd have to be more towards one side or the other to even build a dock on our own parcel. Right, because we'd have to ask Mr. Krebs for permission to enter into his buffer zone because he has right. one 25 foot into our riparian, so. Or into Grand. Or both. <laughs> if, I, if I could just interject, um, and I was just speaking to Jeff Burns about this as well, but 
Um, it seems that the council has a lot of questions. If Mr. Krebs doesn't mind, if we can just wait two weeks and then bring it back on October 15th, that way you could have time to look at it. Would that be helpful? I, I won't be here the 15th. I'm out of town, but I, we can, whenever we get around to it, I guess. Well, it's in the discretion of the council. I just want you all to be comfortable with it. Um, Kyron and then Mr. Destin. Okay. Let me try to get it, explain it in a way that Mr. Braden and everybody understands. And Mr. And the, uh, Mr. Destin, the elder, is out here, and I believe he was on council at the time. The Grand Harbor condominium, when it was being built, was uh, we had an issue with the city. I wasn't on council, but there was an issue with the city. Uh, they sued the city, and they won. What we found out at the time, what the city found out at the time is that just like some of the other roads and streets across from Beach Drive, that is technically Beach Drive right-of-way that comes all the way across to the water. And in order to give Grand Harbor an entrance, they had to give that. And at the same time, we created a small pocket park. Uh, it can't be used for anything except what it is, a little pocket park of view because it's also technically the other side of Beach Drive, if I'm, if I'm correct. And Mr. And, and Mr. Destin, the elder, may be able to help me with that if, if I'm wrong. So there's nothing we can really legally do to it except what's already there. And Mr. Krebs has alluded to the fact that we can't even build a dock because of its, it's marshland, it's protected. There's nothing there except it's a road entrance to the Grand Harbor. If that's basically all we can do. It's not, and, but because of where the dock is existing, and I'm familiar with the property as uh, Mr. Mr. Krebs and myself grew up together, along with the, the previous property owner, there's nothing really you can do with it except what it's already existing there. We can't build a dock. We can't do anything with it. It's an entrance to a, to a uh, condominium with a small little area for the uh, pedestrians to go and look if they want to look, but basically it's the end of a road. And so um, all he's trying to do is get the letter from us so that he can move his dock. And so I don't have a problem with it either. All right. Well, we've had plenty of discussion on this. Uh, the drawing, the very last drawing, actually shows that the present use is about two feet from our property line already. So it's already been utilized uh, well within that riparian uh, line. So this is a letter of concurrence. We, we've had a motion. We've had a second. Mr. Um, Jarvis, could you open it for public comment too since you're planning on taking action here? I'm going to go ahead and let Mr. Braden speak first. Go ahead, Mr. Braden. Um, I don't know why this piece can't have a dock because there's docks all over the state of Florida that are built over wetlands. You, bu you, build, you build a pier, pylons, to walk over it, and there's a dock out there. I mean, they're, they're everywhere, so I don't know where Mr. Marler is getting his information from but they're all over the state of Florida yeah I, I, I probably misspoke other than to say that it is a to move stuff on the wetlands is a big deal if this dock wasn't already going across the wetlands they say what you can do with the land side you can't necessarily just put anything if the the entrance to this dock comes across Florida wetlands and they can't even move that supposedly it's you can't disturb the wetlands you can mow the grass on it <laughs> you can't do anything else with it. Thanks. All right. We've had, oh, Ms. Ramswell. So in the bigger picture, I'm thinking here, in, how, would this interfere with a water taxi stop? Because obviously one of the goals of Heritage Park right up the road is having a, a water taxi, having it along the route of the water tra I can't think of the full name some water trails all along for kayaking and all that would is the setback the same for that sort of a, a water taxi stop or a, a stop of that sort well we're already the dock already exists where it is so, no, 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 not on your property. I'm talking about so on that's our what I'm property. it wouldn't change anything on your property you, well if it's not do. if it doesn't well, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying now because I'm still going back. There's still, it unless is. it's not a 25 foot setback for well, the existing a water dock, taxi stop. Well, the existing dock that's there is there. And all we're wanting to go is continue out. So if even a water right. taxi's got to get up near the beach to drop people off, they can't drop them off out in the middle of the channel and tell them to swim. So the dock situation, if you're going to build a dock at that park, you still have my dock that's already existing sitting there. 
so it's not going to change. You can still build your dock either way. It's not going to. It's not going to affect me. I'm not using the west side of my dock anyways. So it's it's there. And, and if you came to me and said, "Hey, Dave, we want to have zero setback and put our dock right up next year's," what would I care? I'm not using that side of the dock. I'm I'm trying to give everybody all the room that I can by going to the east side of the dock. Right, and I guess what I'm saying is, is a water taxi stop or a kayak launch, is that a different sort of a setback and width requirement in terms of space? It would be the same. It would be, okay. Chatham. Oh, Thank you, Mayor. Um, Mr. Many, Ramsel, how many you feet is Hallelujah. Here again. Okay. Mr. Morgan. How many, how many feet is Hallelujah? 57. 57. Yeah. Um, and you'll be able to fit that in one of the yes. one of your four slips without without encroaching on anybody, right? Yes, without getting into the Eddington side. Cool. Okay. Um, I know it's in your self-interest to do this um, for your company, but I do applaud you for supporting the commercial fishermen because it is getting harder and harder for them to make a living on the harbor. Amen. They're getting squeezed by pontoon boats and jet skis and everything else. So, and and that's that's the root of my concern. I I really financially would have been better off not buying this piece of property other than Destin, I've been here since sure. 1962, it's my life. And I don't want to leave, I don't know where to go, Yep. don't want to go, and I, and I love what we do. Well, I'll support you. Sorry. All right, we've had plenty of discussion. I'm gonna go ahead and call this to a Mr. vote. Mr. Jarvis, uh, public comment first. Sure. Do we have to? Okay, anybody want to talk about the letter of concurrence from Mr. Krebs for 25 foot setback waiver. Seeing none, let's vote. Eyes have it, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Krebs. Thank you, Council. Good to see everybody. All right, next is an update on recent Harbor and Waterway Board discussions regarding observed waterway issues and potential solutions. Mr. Matt Trammell, Harbor and Waterways Board Chairman, will present this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council. I'm just waiting on Doug. Nope. Do you have it all in your agenda packet? It's just four slides. It's pretty brief. Um, just going to give you a brief overview of some of our recent activities. Uh, as you know, the city does have a, a Harbor and Waterways Board. We've been uh, partially proactive here recently in a, in a fair sense. Um, we've, we've taken a, a pretty strong stance here the last couple years to really get more involved, focus more on what our, our true mission is. The Harbor and Waterways Board has basically been just a permitting authority, um, a rubber stamp on any development projects that come forward, both residential and commercial in the harbor, as well as any of the other waterways of Destin, Choctatchee Bay, Indian Bayou, et cetera. Um, but we've really tried to take a step back and the mission is to, you know, obviously review plans for future growth development, uh, but also inventory potential or existing sources of pollution, come up with uh, uh, potential solutions, monitor the overall condition of Destin Harbor, quite a charge in itself. Um, protect coastal resources, reduce adverse impacts to water quality, protect and enhance coastal shorelines. So with that, uh, this was, you know, a bit of our first stab. You know, I'm not looking for direction tonight. Really just wanted to bring you all up to speed. Um, not a formal vote, but maybe we could have a, a brief discussion on what direction you see the Harbor Board going, what you'd like to see from us. I think that would be a big help. Um, as we move forward. So I'm not going to review all of these, but we tried to compartmentalize some of the biggest issues that we've, we've seen in the harbor, as well as, uh, you know, Joe's Bayou, the other smaller bayous, um, Destin Waterways. We've excluded Crab Island. There's a number of discussion about Crab Island workshops and all. Just wanted to stay focused on some things we could accomplish first, and then we can uh, start branching out from there. But, you know, sewage is a big problem. In Destin Harbor, uh, it's not as well known as it as a uh, as you may think. Um, I, some ways where we can benefit, uh, we really need some education and outreach. Destin Harbor used to have a mid channel when you came in. Destin Harbor is a no discharge zone. 
reference the code and ordinance. That code is still there in the land development code. The sign is not. Um, I think we could really use a re reminder, and I'm, I'm not for you know signage all up and down the waterfront on the water, but uh, reminding some of our visitors that come in and, and anchor up as a safe mooring. Um, we definitely could use some increased enforcement, some stiffer fines, uh, increased so, uh, public sewage pump out facilities. It's really hard to get folks to use these, but the more uh, more available they are, the more they will become used. Uh, there's a couple of proposals, I think BP related, where we could uh, put large scale facilities out there. Um, perhaps we need to do a better job of tracking commercial vessels, um, not trying to throw shade at anyone or any, anyone's business. Uh, a lot of our charter boats, they have heads, they're capable of going out the sufficient distance to discharge those, discharge them at the proper marinas. We have a lot of uh, larger commercial vessels that don't necessarily leave the harbor that much. Um, we need to make sure that they're disposing of their sewage in the proper manner. And you know, if you had plenty of restrooms on the harbor, maybe you wouldn't need so many pump outs. So anytime we have a park project coming up, uh, you're doing a good job with Heritage Park, having a restroom there, let's make it as large as we possibly can. Um, I'm sure it'll be heavily utilized. Dissolved auction is a big problem. We, we need to make sure the pump station is addressed. Uh, I know Mr. Campbell's been doing a good job with that. Uh, the Harbor Board fully supports uh, improving that and making sure there's a fixed budget for operation and maintenance. Um, nutrients and turbidity, this is one of those that you don't quite really know it's a problem until it's too bad of a problem. We get a, a bad red tide, we get a bad fish kill. It's hard to come back from that. Um, we've been very fortunate we haven't had that issue, but if you look at the water quality testing, there are a number of nutrients, there are um, some other problems in the harbor. Uh, we need to do a little better job uh, with enhanced stormwater treatment, working with this and water users, identify potential problem areas, uh, minimize our direct outfalls. We're allowed to directly discharge to some of these open waters, but is that necessarily something we should do? Um, we should take a look at all of these uh, waterfront developments, make sure we're doing the best we can. Uh, living shorelines uh, along the waterway. Um, Mr. Guy Tadlock serves on the board. He's been doing a good job uh, trying to help us target some volunteer property owners on Holiday Isle that would like to see the Choctatchee Basin Alliance come in and do a demonstration project. Maybe this is something we can do at the uh, Harborfront Park that you were just discussing, a, a small city park. Maybe this is something we could do uh, over in Joe's Bayou. The bagged oyster shell, the planting of marsh grasses, it works. It's attractive, at least in my opinion. Um, it helps to filter out some of the pollutants that are, you know, overland runoff. Uh, I think more people see that, the more it becomes prevalent and the more they may be encouraged to implement it on their own property. Um, a lot of people love green grass, I do too. We need to maybe consider reducing some of the fertilizer or just educating folks on you know, hey, maybe only fertilizer in certain amounts a year. Please avoid, you know, fertilizing during heavy rainfall. We'd want that fertilizer to stay on the lawns and not necessarily run off into the harbor or some of our other waterways. Um, and then again, always need to be looking at the code, making sure we're doing the best to encourage these things. Trash is a big problem in Destin Harbor. Uh, you know, you perhaps there's some signs down there. I, I could be wrong, but I think a uh, one of the best things we could do is keep the harbor clean and let our visitors and our residents know that we want to do that. Um, signage such as keep Destin Harbor clean, this, this storm drain uh, goes down to Destin Harbor, no trash, no litter. The little things such as that do go a long way, but we also have to pick up the trash. Um, you know, tourists come in town, they see a harbor that's littered with cigarette butts, with beer cans they're not necessarily encouraged to pick up their trash um, to go find the closest receptacle. We need to do a better job of, um, you know, picking up the trash and, and keeping that appearance. And then, you know, celebrating it with some signs. Um, we had one of uh, the boat captains, uh, Mr. Klosterman, come up and uh, propose to the Harbor Board actually floating trash bins. I thought it was a great idea. They're around a couple thousand dollars a piece. Something we're going to be looking at as far as uh, utilizing some of the net positive environmental benefit fees that we're going to have in the coffer here in the near future with some developments coming up. We have certain trouble areas where we see a lot of cigarette butts and floating trash, plastic cups hitting the water in the harbor, um, anchoring a couple of these floating trash bins that actually suck in the trash and, and uh, 
probably dispose of it. We had even some boat captains that volunteered to, to manage and maintain these things for us. So um, some exciting things there, but I don't think we can have too many trash, uh, trash receptacles or signs um, on the upland. Uh, boat captains do a great job of fish carcasses, but we still see a lot of them in the harbor. Uh, I'm not quite sure where they're coming from. Maybe south side, some of the private docks, um, folks that aren't you know, going out on their boat the next day to, to dispose of them, but they're, they're out there and they become a problem pretty quickly. Um, I don't know how you police that, but you definitely got to have people on the, on the water uh, full time. Um, I put on here, uh, designate no smoking areas along the harbor. Um, that's a, it's a pretty big ask, I understand, but we just had a beach cleanup at Noriego Point. Number one trash item, again, year in, year out, cigarette butts. Um, number one trash item probably on the, on the ground in the Harbor District, cigarette butts. Um, it's, we need to make sure there's cigarette receptacles or maybe we need to consider no smoking zones. Um, even plastic bags. I know it's a big ask, plastic bag ban, but something maybe we should consider. Um, heavy metals, oils and grease, very similar. It's, it's hard to target. Um, we need some better resources to, dar to target those, and then we need some resources to, uh, to address the problem. And then lastly, uh, safety. We've, we've broken this up into just general safety, derelict vessels and navigation, waterway uh, congestion. Um, general safety, uh, it was pretty unanimous with the board having increased law enforcement, uh, a law enforcement presence, whether that be hiring, or, and I know the city did budget, um, for the extra sheriff's deputy to be out there on the water, perhaps we need to consider an extra FWC officer. Um, we need to make sure not only that the presence is there, but they're ticketing the individuals that need to be ticketed. Um, and maybe it needs to be Har Destin Harbor, Crab Island, and, and the backside of uh, uh, Joe's Bayou or the, the backside of the city. Um, we, I, I noticed the, this past week the county had put up no wake signs for, we went six months without a no wake sign at the interest of Destin Harbor. I've been spending a lot of time at Noriego Point, a lot of no-wake violations. People just come right into the harbor full plane and slow down once they come around to Emerald Grand. Um, the no-wake sign is going to help, but you've got to have someone out there enforcing it. You've got to have someone flashing the lights, and they've got to have police powers. They've got to be able to ticket folks. Um, I love to say, let's put a city staffer on a boat, but unless you can write a ticket um, and look pretty scary, they're probably not going to listen. Um, increased education for boat rental, again, not, not trying to pick on those folks, but um, you know, maybe we need to come up with some sort of uh, regulated practice, and I know they must have an education program to get their livery vessel permit. Um, maybe we need to take a closer look at that. The Harbor Board wasn't involved there. Uh, maybe we could provide some, some guidance. Derelict vessels, it, it's a, a difficult one. As you know, I, I know that's a, a touchy subject with, with Mr. Dixon. Um, we just need to work with FWC. They've got a vessel at risk program. We need to make sure how we can do a better job. What's, what's our direct line to FWC? As soon as we see those vessels, let's, let's let FWC know. Um, possible code and, uh, revisions. I, you know, parking out on Crab Island for any extended period of time, um, that's a touchy subject, but Noriego Point's right in our backyard. We have a brand new park. Perhaps something we should consider is you know, a boat wants to pull up, watch the fireworks for the night, that's great, but do we really want them beaching there for the next three, four, five days, week, month, however long it may be? Um, perhaps we should consider a limit. That's city property. That's something you can't easily regulate. Um, maybe we should consider looking at a, a code revision there. Uh, and then navigation, uh, again, increased law enforcement. Um, Straightening and, and realigning the Destin Harbor Channel, uh, we did feel that that would assist the navigation uh, within Destin Harbor, reduce some of the congestion, especially at the mouth, um, increase signage, uh, education outreach, and uh, possibly designated or regulated mooring areas. And uh, my last, my last uh, point was, um, you know, the we really do need uh, a vision for Destin Harbor. We did, it, Taylor Engineering had done a, the waterways study uh, outlining some, some guidance for the city so many months ago, uh, outlining code revisions, um, mooring fields, straightening the channel. I think it was like six or seven items that we had uh, targeted as potential options for the city moving forward. One of which, and the most important I think, is establishing a vision 
of Destin Harbor and where we want to be in the future. Um, without that, you know, you yourself, as well as the, the residents, the business owners, the Harbor Board, we're all kind of struggling as to, you know, what, what is the best recommendation? Where do we want to be in the next 10 to 20 years? Do we still want to be the world's luckiest fishing village, the world's largest charter boat fleet, or the world's largest pontoon livery? Um, whatever it may be, we need to make sure that the proper stakeholders are involved. And I don't think, you know, I, I don't want each one of us to come up tonight and, you know, figure this out uh, right here and now. You know, this is our vision for Destin Harbor, but it is something that I think the Harbor Board would very much appreciate, as well as myself and all of the other stakeholders down there on the water. Perhaps we need a visioning session, a workshop. Um, the staff did submit, I think Mr. Schmidt had submitted a grant for that exact thing. Um, I'm not sure how we fared on that. Uh, it's, it's been something we've been talking about for a while, but I really would like to see us, and me speaking on behalf of the Harbor Board, we would really like to see the city uh, establish that vision and, and let us help you get there. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll just close with one last point. I want to read real quick, um, you know, our, our mission for the, the Harbor Board. And, and I apologize, this is late. You've approved your budget. Um, we've been trying for months to get this pulled together. We have a, an issue with attendance and um, some membership on the Harbor Board. We're working to, to fix that. Uh, so we tried to get in before the budget was passed. Uh, we tried to get you a better work plan. We will be more prepared. Um, I think we're going to try for the spring of next year. Uh, but one of the things or the, from the Land Development Code, this is the charge that's given to the Harbor Board. Inventory all existing and potential sources of pollution, summarizing. Uh, monitor overall condition of the harbor, uh, water depths, dredging activities, violation of laws, sanitation, yada, yada. Uh, recommend current comprehensive plan, future growth development, and restoration of Destin Harbor Ways initiatives. Cooperate and consult with city boards. Recommend to the council needed actions. Recommend funding programs. Recommend to the council purchase leach acquisition of other properties. And on top of that, reviewing the existing development and all of the other mission statements that I gave before. That's a full-time job. Um, I think we need to take another look. Very, and I think the Harbor Board does a very good job. And before I forget, Mr. Dick Hoy is here, Casey Jones, Guy Tadlock, uh, Mark Meyer. Uh, that's our Harbor Board right now. We're two members short. Um, it's hard enough just to get a quorum. We all have full-time jobs and we're all volunteers. But I, if we could, and I, and I know your budget is set, um, let's really consider hiring a Harbor Master that's uh, perhaps an environmental scientist, that their job is, you know, not a harbor master in the sense that they just drive around in a boat all day and check mooring fields and signage and that sort of thing, but uh, they have just as much office work as they do field work. They're the ones out patrolling, looking for code enforcement violations in the waterfront district. They're the ones monitoring water quality. They're the ones uh, crunching the data. You know, you, your staff does a very good job, but they're extremely limited um, in what they're able to give us as far as information. And uh, we do a lot of homework on our own, but it would certainly help the city if we had a, a full-time staffer specifically dedicated to, and when I say harbor, I, I really mean all of Destin's waterways. So with that, I'm finished. I'll all right, for any stay questions. up there, Matt. Uh, we got a number of council members want to speak, so maybe just hang tight. Sure. Uh, first up, be Mr. Dixon. Ah, yes, thank you, Matt. Um, many years ago, we used to have a dive group or maybe two or three dive groups that used to get together once every two or three years and they used to go through the harbor and help us clean up the harbor um, and basically the city would provide dumpsters and some help to load the stuff up that they would pull out of the harbor and I just know that we haven't done that for a long time and I've seen the harbor um, be pretty embarrassing at times um, and I know it's probably after a big storm has come through and wind has blown the Dixie cups and stuff like that into the water and and uh, and I know during the summertime people are so busy they don't get it cleaned up a lot of times very quickly but there's stuff out there that's been there for years and traffic cones and things like that car that, batteries yeah batteries and whatever else is out there that if we could get a little bit of assistance and maybe provide them with a little something but to be able to maybe send some divers out you know, that are part of a dive club or something like that to help us with some of that, that'd be great if we could work something like that out. 
I think it's a great idea. I, I took a note here. Um, and one of the things I had on the list was maybe just establishing a website where people could report oil slicks, sewage spills, trash in the water. We have a compiled list of that and then perhaps this staffer or code enforcement or we organize a, a volunteer group to go out there and, and clean up. I was actually a part of that after Opal and Dennis came through. We, we cleaned up the harbor, but yeah. They were focused okay. on washing machines and cars at the time, but yeah. it's there's Well, I do know even between the hurricanes we've had many years yeah. ago, they picked up tires and things that just been there for years. It's a but, great idea. Yeah. Um, another thing, too, is that I don't remember exactly what we had decided on the harbor pump. Um, uh, um, Dave, if you could maybe refresh my memory on that. I think that we were basically decided to go with a maybe a little different system or something. Well, <clears throat> what we've um, recently done, it's the, the harbor pump is currently running. It's still vibrating, but we're, we're able to run it. Um, it's getting close to the time where we pull it out of the water for, um, uh, for its yearly you know, rehab. Although we've, <laughs> I say yearly, we should be doing that yearly. We haven't for, for quite a while. Um, and I'd like to thank Mr. Tadlock for uh, coming down to the to the harbor and, and brainstorming some ideas on what we could do to stop that vibration. Um, what we're going to try is to re-gear it and slow it down. Um, and maybe we can stop that vibration and still get some useful years out of that pump. Uh, I had earlier talked about getting a smaller pump um, that I think would accomplish the same thing. We would just have to run it a little longer, but it would surely be easier to pull out of the water. I thought we had approved an expenditure of some different type of pump system to go in there. We approved, or you, uh, City Council approved an expenditure to, um, to rehab the building facility. Um, but uh, no, 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 no. It was the pump because I remember we have like an inline pump, and we had ch changed it to a pump that was up and down instead of a. Uh, a I, I do remember the pump discussion. If we could just go back and figure out where we were when that discussion came up, best I can remember, it was about um, six months ago, four months ago, something like that. So if we could figure that out, then we know going forward exactly what was said and done back that time. Okay. If we could get that ready for the next city council meeting. I'd appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dixon. Uh, Ms. Marler. Matt, other than uh, Harbor, Harbor Walk Marina's pump out, is there another pump out in the harbor? There's a number of private facilities, but to my knowledge, that's the only. Uh, the the co-op docks had one for a time, and I believe it's still down, but um, I believe that's the only private facility in the harbor, or public facility, excuse me. Okay, and the other thing I had was uh, I would like to see your people uh, give us some personally give us some ideas on the expansion for Joe's Bayou since we purchased that the concrete plant I'd like to see some ideas from you, know, you guys on expansion and uh, you know conservation of that area there especially after all the you know the years it was a concrete plant and things we need to do to make it uh, you know more presentable to the to the public and also useful to us at the same time besides just for parking sure all right love to Thank you, Mr. Uh, Marler. Um, I went through all your recommendations, Matt, and, and you have some really good ones. Uh, the sign, increased signage and education campaigns uh, really crucial and, and needs to be done. Uh, talking about the, the sewage issue, uh, the uh, pr presentation we had from Pump Out USA using uh, uh, some of the restore money was might want to fit in you may want to reach back out to Craig Barker and, and, and mm -hmm. see if you can't come to, to a scaled down version maybe something that could uh, really benefit the harbor and Joe's bio and then bring it back to our council and uh, delivery vessel training requirements is that that's that's something you guys can bounce around and bring back to us and, and, and something we need to look at you know when we're issuing our our business tax receipts i think that excellent uh, a little criticism on a couple of them the further enforcement or that kind of thing when it comes to oil spills or sewage that already falls under the united states coast guard and the fwc so 
as far as pulling people over or writing them up or trying to code enforcement to enforce that, that's outside of not only right now our jurisdiction because we don't have a harbor master or a special waterways designation, but that's their job. Mm -hmm. And they have basically 911 numbers for oil spills, uh, sewage pollution, um, th those type of things. And that's where maybe our education campaign right. would come into play is yeah. to get the general public to know, call FWC if you see carcasses in the water. Call FWC if you know somebody's pumping raw sewage. Uh, they love writing those $275 tickets. Uh, they do random stops for charter boats and private vessels on a regular basis. Maybe that's something that we can, as a city, we can talk with the commander, FWC commander, and maybe ramp those up. But uh, when it comes to oil spills, and pollution, oil sheens on the water, that is strictly within the Coast Guard's jurisdiction. They handle all the civil and legal penalties associated with that. And, and that's just something, you know, I know your intent was good, but those sure. people are there. We just need to get the general public to understand where to turn to report those. I think it's a great idea. And we get reports, you know, citizens come up to the Harbor Board and even if it's a code enforcement officer, someone throwing trash in, if you didn't see it, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, you actually have to have that code enforcement officer see it. So it's, it's difficult to police, and, uh, but if, if we just had a website, you know, you see an issue on the harbor, here's your you know, top three hotline numbers, DEP, CORE, NOAA, Coast Guard. That's a great idea. I'm all for it. Yeah. Something our new uh, harbor master intern or staff worker could do for us. I like your thinking. <laughs> Ms. Ramswell. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so a couple things. I, I love the idea about contacting FWC and seeing about getting an extra officer. Mm -hmm. um, I would think that's something that would be easily accomplished. And I, is that staff? Is that, do we need to do some direction to that? But I think that's a wonderful idea. I, I can take that. Um, we actually, and this goes back to Dave Bazalak and uh, Miss Gates had taken over and now we're working with Dawn and her time is extremely limited. Um, but uh, I think but the transition between David and, and uh, Miss Gates, we actually looked at, uh, and I think we did make the recommendation and one of them had brought it forward, but it was somewhere on the order of $50,000 and you could have an FWC officer for the 100 days of summer and a couple hot weekends, you know, a little bit of uh, spring break time and here and there. But that is something they regularly do. So the city of Destin could or however you want to fund it, um, could fund an FWC officer with the specific intent of them patrolling a designated area. It would seem like they are self-funding. I mean, I don't, maybe that's well, something you, you, you can, can look You can into. request them, but what they're going to say is, we'll respond in accordance to the emergency that presents itself. So, but if you want a dedicated officer for an area, you can fund them to come in. Okay, and along that same train of thought, back in August of 2016, this council had actually discussed the possibility of having a harbor master, and we brought it up during budget talks. And I cannot recall what happened with that because we did. Can you shed some light on that for me? Because what it seemed to have traction. What happened with the harbor master position? Um, I think it was. And I'm not saying anything negative about city staff, but I think city staff complicated it so much that nobody in the world would probably have qualified for it. So we never got a harbor master. We had it to where they had to have a degree in. That's uh, right. It the was yeah. Yeah, it was it it was so restrictive that we could have never hired anybody for it. So that's the reason it got put away. And I think there was a reason for that. Reason for that was just that really didn't want it. So. We made it as difficult as we possibly could to not have it. So I think if we came back with a better job description, because I was one who pushed for this, or I was one of the ones who pushed for this, that um, if we came back with a different job description and be able to um, define the duties a little bit better, I don't know that they actually need a degree in, in, in whatever, that it, marine biology or whatever it may be, but I do think we need somebody familiar with the water, and I think we need somebody that understands that kind of thing, but I don't think we need to make it so restrictive that basically, you know, the job would be a $200,000, $300,000 a year job. So. Bragg, did we fund it that year, do you recall? 
You don't recall or no, we didn't? Okay. No, I remember the debate. We, we had about four different options. Harbor Master was one of them, and he fell, and that person fell off, the, that position fell off the list. If you remember, I think we talked about, uh, right, and we were going to discuss, and, and we decided to fund, um, I think, an extra sheriff's boat, an extra sheriff's deputy. Somebody was on a jet ski. Do you remember that discussion? That was when the Harbor Master fell I, off the list. I do remember it, but I do remember the looking at the job description and knowing full well that oh, yeah, there was, was no way that that was ever going to fly. So, yeah. I, I just want to call out one thing on the list, and I got to give uh, Dawn, her name, last name is escaping me, but uh, in the planning department, it was her idea that with all of the water quality data that we have to, to compress and review and um, you know plot out in GIS, uh, she said, well, would the board be interested in bringing on an intern for the summer to help out with this water quality? Oh, that was a great idea, um, as did the entire board. So perhaps we can bring this intern on next summer, um, and that could just be a, a kid in college, maybe even a high school student, to go out there and collect water quality data. And we've got a ton of data. We just don't have the time or the resources to crunch the numbers. So that may help provide us some direction there. That would be a great possibility because I know with the Destin High School that we're pursuing, marine biology, marine science, that, that field is something that we are looking at focusing on. Yeah. So that could be a good match. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on was you talked about trying to develop some sort of master plan or overall view to try to spruce up the Harbor District, if you will. And I was not on council at this time, but back December 8th, 2006, um, Tetra Tech was actually, they made this formal announcement that they were being brought on to actually do a complete conceptual planning and design for the entire Harbor District. And it says the waterfront boardwalk, parking improvements, pedestrian and water access improvements, roadway and street, streetscape improvements, public plazas and spaces, and stormwater improvements. So I know obviously some of that has been accomplished or attempted to be accomplished through the years, but I'd love to see whatever plan. Were you all ever privy to that? Have you ever seen that? I think I don't want to speak on behalf of the board, but I think that was before all of our time. Um, but that's exactly what we're talking about. It needs to be a full comprehensive plan where you're not only, and all of us are, are really would like to see the heritage of the working waterfront brought forward. Um, and, but you need the upland property owners, you need the upland business owners, you need the waterfront business owners, you need the waterfront uh, operators to be involved in that conversation as well as staff. So it's this public workshop, this planning exercise is not going to be something we accomplish in a four hour session and it's, you know, we pat ourselves on the back. It's, it really needs to be a full blown comprehensive planning process. Yeah, I would love to, to see. Yeah, I'd love to see if staff or someone can look through files and try to find whatever this <laughs> giant master plan concept, concept was that Tetra Tech was doing. Because maybe that's something that we can revisit, or maybe they did everything. I, I don't know, but it'd be worth taking a look at it for sure. And then the last thing that just popped into my head was I know that the CRA had a joint session with the Harbor CRA a couple times here this year for at least the first time since I've been on council. And we found it to be tremendously eye-opening and productive. I'm wondering if you guys have ever had um, a meeting with the Harbor CRA for the, sort of the same reasons, since y'all cover a lot of the same territory and issues. Casey's on the Harbor CRA, and he keeps us apprised of a lot of the issues um, that are going on out there, and, and I tried to do my best you know, with my institutional knowledge with Norego Point and dredging and um, so we've got a, a very good board, but absolutely. I mean, the more involvement we have, the better. <clears throat> Thank you so much for putting all that together. Sure. It's really illuminating. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ramswell, Mr. Destin, and we'll wrap this up. Matt. Yeah, I'll be I'll be very brief. I believe uh, Mr. Dixon and I probably uh, gave the concurrence and direction to staff to reach out to the FWC about derelict vessels and us going hand in hand with uh, FWC to identify and use the statutory provisions that they have to identify, contact the owner, and then remove uh, any derelict vessels. So um, I don't know where that conversation stands between Lance and FWC, but I'd like to have 
you get with Lance so that we can contact FWC because I'll be a, a staunch supporter of you finding the money once you guys get a, an agreement from FWC saying if, if you guys fund us we will go hand in hand identify these vessels and we'll go through that process and if the Harbor Ways um, and Water Board wants to help identify all the derelict vessels that we need to get out of our local waterways and bring that list back to us I can guarantee you'll probably have mine and probably Mr. Dixon's support at the very beginning to uh, to fund whatever you need to get those vessels out sure it's it's difficult if you could just help us out in in the uh, potential for drafting an ordinance you know do we really want boats moored up Noriega Point for example or Joe's Bayou do we want people mooring up there for weeks on end because once they're there it's hard to get rid of them yeah, that's a good agenda item for a workshop. <laughs> start there before we start delving into ordinances. Um, Lance, uh, if we could work on 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 trying to set up, um, start a workshop process uh, to address some of these issues. I know it's another meeting, but it's it's a it's a specific issue, and it, it, we need a workshop format so everyone has plenty of opportunity to weigh in, plus the public. I'd be happy to do that. And just a quick update, uh, right in line with what we're talking about. FWC has identified three boats that have fulfilled the timeline um, that they need to in order for them to proceed with removal, and they should be being removed within the next 10, 10 days to is, two weeks. Is one of those southwest of Marlar Bayou in the bay right now? Yes. You sure? That's my understanding. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, Matt, real quick before you leave, you, your board has five members right now. Correct. Um, Ray, do you know which council members have not uh, appointed a member to this board? I have to check the list. Okay. Yeah. You can do that. That'd be great. All yeah. right. Yeah, if we can give you all some homework, let's find out who those are. I don't, I don't know, but um, we really need a full board. That would help. Thank you, Matt. Thank Appreciate you it very much. All right. We're going to move on to the uh, public comment portion of our meeting. Uh, Jim Green. Uh, Ms. Ram, I was going to speak to what Ms. Ramswell uh, spoke to as I'm vice chairman of the Harbor CRA Advisory Committee, and I was sitting back there thinking, you know, visioning for the harbor, you know, I was going to come up here anyway, but you touched on it that I'm sure our board, our committee would love to get together with them. And also, once Ray finds out whoever it is, uh, whoever needs to have an appointee, that uh, I'd be happy to apply for that and fill one of the seats. So thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Green, Captain Green. Um, I don't have a whole bunch of cards, so, Ms. well, Ray's got an extra card. So, Mr. Shelton, you're not going to be the only one speaking tonight. Step right up, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council staff. Uh, as a side note uh, to follow up on Matt, I do know of one uh, marina uh, the ultimate condo at 280 Gulf Shore Drive. They have an excellent pump out facility and they welcome anybody to come over there and use that. Uh, I've used it many times, so I just thought I'd pass that on. Uh, what, I, what I want to speak to you tonight about is a little over a year ago, this council, and I'm speaking for the benefit of the new people on the council, uh, a bit over a year ago, uh, the council was almost ready to vote on these short term rental. Uh, regulations and one night six people stood up at the end of the meeting and convinced this council uh, to form a short-term task force committee uh, all six of those save one and he's here tonight were from out of count out of, out of city didn't live in the city most of them lived in Walton County uh, we that that uh, task force was appointed by this council and we went to work. We went to work hard. Uh, we held a series of nine meetings. There were seven of us on the task force. And there was always two and sometimes four uh, staff members at those meetings. And uh, Mr. Overdyer uh, was uh, getting ready to run for election. He attended most of them, so he, he knows. Uh, so we, if you just do the numbers, you'll see that we spent well over 200 hours, 200 man hours coming up with some recommendations that was presented to this council. And the, uh, the voting record was there. Uh, every, everybody had the opportunity to review it. And then all of a sudden, we had the staff change over. A new city manager, a new community development director, 
uh, code enforcement people, uh, and it seems like this process has stopped. And what I, what I would like to call for is for to get this thing back on the agenda. Uh, we're now at the time of the year where uh, it's the best time of the year. Uh, your reservation uh, stuff starts really heavy right after the 1st of January and runs up to about the 1st of March. And so we need to have something on the books, if we're going to put it on the books, uh, before we get to the first of the year. Uh, and I might mention that during these uh, meetings, uh, I don't believe there was a one of them that were not attended by lobbyists out of uh, Tallahassee uh, who either represented Airbnb or VRBO. Uh, there's another one that you have, probably haven't heard about. It's called Open Door. Open Door has raised over $1 billion in capital. Uh, they're opening, uh, they're going, opening up in two cities every month. That's their goal for the year 2019. And you, you're talking about going to be messing with our land development code. When they do what their business plan uh, says that they want to do, uh, it's, going to, it's going to blow your shoes off. Because what they're going to do is they're going to do everything. Um, we're, and I'm talking about, they're going to buy your house. If you want to sell your house, they're going to have it appraised and they're going to offer you a, 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 an amount. And if you agree to that, they're going to pay you in cash with no contingencies in the contract at any date that you want in the future. So what it does, it takes the, the, uh, the probability of somebody being stuck with two mortgage payments away. And then they're going to turn back around and resell that house after they, you know, put lipstick on the pig and that sort of thing. And their goal is to create a new form of buyer which will be co-owners. And you, you may have uh, four different people that own the house, and one of these particular owners may, it'll, it'll be kind of like a timeshare in the condominium market, uh, just to give you an idea. So I encourage you to, to get educated. I know you probably get tired of receiving emails from me, but when I, when I run across an article uh, uh, that I think is important, uh, I send it to the council, and I hope you all do read them. I get very few responses, but uh, uh, I hope you're educating yourself. And, and that's all I have to say, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. I'd just like to tell you I'm ahead of you already. I have spoke with some of the council meetings here. We're going to, you know, we're not doing any more workshops or anything like that. We have so much business between now and Christmas that I would plan on calling a special short-term rental meeting to finish the ordinance specific just to short-term rentals that the public can attend and that we can legislate and finish it. So. We, we, yeah, and, and, and my thought was as along years, we need to have this done before December, not only for to finish the project or finish the job of getting the ordinance done, but to allow the business community time to adjust to the new rules. And, and I, let me say one more thing. Uh, two of the members on this short-term rental task force, one being a homeowner at Crystal Beach, uh, and well, both of them are homeowners at Crystal Beach. One of them was a manager, and the other one was simply a homeowner. They're moving. Out of, they're moving out of town. They're moving out of the county. Both of them are moving to North Walton County on the other side of the bay. Uh, we're losing a lot of people, and uh, y'all y'all need to really think about that. We're, we're committed to getting it done. I think this, the whole council and myself are committed to finish this ordinance. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Brown. Patty Brown, 86 Shire Street, Destin, Florida. I'm sure you guys have had plenty of emails the last couple of weeks from me. <laughs> Every day, at least one. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's really frustrating because we did pass some of those things. They were a unanimous vote, and the council agreed to put them in effect, and we are doing nothing with them. Trash cans are still being left out. Tickets are not being written for trash cans. We still have parking everywhere, as you saw all the pictures I've sent you guys. This is incredibly frustrating, because as Daryl said, we spent hours and hours and hours researching, getting information from everywhere. And it's like we're not being heard. It's like, you know, it doesn't really matter with the residents. And it's... It's not right. We need to 
look at these pictures. I, some of you probably aren't even opening my emails anymore because you get so many, but I'm really frustrated. And I'm frustrated that I only heard back from one council member after all the emails that I sent when I said, is anyone listening? And one council member said, I'm listening. And I met actually with Lance this week. I had, no, it was last week, right, Lance? Um, I had asked him about getting it back on the agenda. He asked me to come in and kind of go over uh, what we did and, and the research and to kind of bring him up to speed. And him and Mr. Schmidt were there, and I think I pretty much got you guys up to speed. So I would really hope that we could get this on. But even more so, we can get this on and agree to these things, but if we're not enforcing them, it changes nothing. And so we need to enforce these things. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thanks. I responded. I, I sent you an email. Oh, okay. All right. Just uh, I sent you an email with my cell phone number so you can text or call me personally so we can meet this week and, and talk about it. That's pro appropriately where it probably went. <laughs> Ms. Rams, what? Thank you, Mayor. So I have a question that I guess for the city manager. <laughs> I hate to put you on the spot, but what are we doing in terms of enforcing those issues and that we have already addressed and established as a rule and as an ordinance? I can tell you that um, I had a meeting with the code enforcement manager today and we talked through some of these issues and we're trying to get a plan in place to where we can do a better job enforcing all of the codes, including these. Um, one of the things that we discussed was at the end of the 100 days of summer, um, code enforcement staff went to a reduced schedule. There weren't not as much coverage um, on the weekends and in the evening times. And I challenged him to come back with a plan to put back some enhanced coverage even during the shoulder season, um, because it's obvious by some of the emails that we're all getting that we need that. Um, and unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, a lot of this stuff is occurring not between the hours of 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Um, so we need to possibly look as a city at the city's open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I'm not saying that we can cover all of that, but we, we can certainly cover more than 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, and my understanding was when we approved the hiring of additional code enforcement personnel, last budget cycle, I asked the specific question, would this extend their hours and include nights and weekends? And I was told yes. But I know I've gotten multiple calls and emails after hours saying, who do we contact? There's no number. If I call the city, it goes to voicemail. Then it says voicemail not set up. So do we have people working nights and weekends? Did we ever? My understanding, and, and through, our conver through the conversation I had just today, um, we, we did have code enforcement officers working um, parts of the weekend and later into the evening during the 100 days of summer. But as soon as Labor Day hit, that um, went back to normal business hours, 8 to 5. And that, in my opinion, is something that is a gap that we have. It's an opportunity for improvement that we can address and, and get back to some later, some coverage later into the evening when we know these, these things are going to occur. Thank you for looking into that. And it'd be great to have, like, I don't know, I mean, people don't even know where to call, really. So if we could do some sort of effort where you dial this number if it's 2 in the morning and people are blaring, I mean, whatever, because people just don't know who to call and what to do, and they feel like, you know, they're burdening the sheriff's office. Well, the sheriff, so in order for the process to work, I think we've got to start by really having a good effort of telling them what number or what email or what it is they're supposed to do as a citizen who's encountering such issues. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Ramswell. Um, Mr. Marler. Just as a side note, the previous city manager and I had to agree with her on this, and, and uh, you're sending an unarmed un, uh, a person out there to try to enforce a code 
they have no backup or anything and if you get into a belligerent argument with a uh, individual at, at, a, at one of the properties you you're sending a person out there that has no no backup or anything unless they call the sheriff's department I mean we can I had discussion with the city manager uh, the other day uh, on how we could possibly give the code enforcement more uh, powers uh, yes they can call the sheriff's department which they should if there's an issue in that particular case but I mean nights I mean to send one of our code enforcement people out there at you know late at late at night with no with nothing except uh, a, a notepad is not the right way to do this I wouldn't want to put any of our staff in harm's way that's all I had to say thank you Mr. Marler uh, Mr. Braden um, would that be we've been talking about hiring an officer um, and trying to come up with a task for that individual would this not be one of those if we were hiring an officer they could do after hours um, I did meet with Captain Nix last week on this exact on this topic um, I don't know that the sheriff wants to get involved in the business of code enforcement but I can tell you that the sheriff will absolutely respond if if any of our code enforcement officers feel like they are in danger they will they will respond immediately to that location go ahead so uh, the sheriff did say that um, that they did not want to make, even getting paid for it look at the possibility of assisting us with code enforcement they're, they are happy to assist us with code enforcement. I don't know that they have, the, the posse numbers are down and I've got Captain Nix here if, you, if he wants to address this. Um, but they, they are already helping our code enforcement whenever we request them to. Mr. Nix. Yes, sir. Uh, Councilman Dixon, what we were talking about earlier before the meeting uh, started a lot of the stuff that we're talking about here tonight we already do when code enforcement needs us to do it to hire somebody specifically to do that would just be a waste of money for the city we already we're, we're already helping with parking issues if a code enforcement officer encounters anybody that is being belligerent all they have to do is call us we'll go out we'll stand with them while they do their job We'll make sure that they're protected. Um, but to hire somebody specifically to do that would just be a waste of money. I mean, I, I, am I the only one here that's really frustrated with this? Because no. we have code enforcement. We hire code enforcement officers to enforce code. If they're scared to go out and enforce code, then that ain't the job for them. We need to hire somebody else. Because right now, we've got codes that are not being enforced. We've done everything within our power to try to give code enforcement enough officers, enough people to do the job they're supposed to do. And all I'm hearing is excuses. And I'm not putting any blame on any one person or staff or council or anywhere, but something has to be done. We've got to, if it's something that we have lacked to do, that we need to do to empower them properly, please tell us because this is unsatisfactory to me that we've got code enforcement officers that are not responding nights weekends that they're apparently scared to go out or I, I don't it yeah uh, that's it uh, go ahead mr. Dixon I'm sorry uh, the you know the, the things that I was speaking of as far as like you know a tire a little bit of extra law enforcement would be just during the peak seasons really and and what I was mainly speaking of is areas where we don't get any compliance in other words whatever we do and, and it, it just people aren't compliant the the next thing is is that to have um, you know a a deputy that could maybe patrol areas that we've got problems and maybe to making sure that the parking regulations are adhered to in some of the areas where we have some major concerns and so that's why I thought about possibility of trying to bring a deputy uh, maybe not on board certainly not full-time or just part-time but especially on 
you know, change over days and stuff like that. I think one warning would be enough from a deputy to let the people know that the way they're parking is unacceptable. So I, I kind of, my line of thinking was is just have somebody, especially for like the Saturdays and Sundays, the weekend stuff, or the change over days, whenever they are now, and um, to be able to, to kind of patrol in the areas that, um, and on the weekends especially, when, when the city is not operational. And so, um, you know, I do know we have code enforcement officers on the weekends and things like that, but it's almost impossible to keep up with with the amount of code enforcement needs doing is to be able to do all of it. And so I kind of thought maybe hiring some part-time deputies to do it might help us out a little bit. Just an idea. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Brayton. Thanks. Um, apparently most of these are occurring at short-term rentals. Um, my question is, is what about the signage that is supposed to be posted on that piece of property to, that we can call? I don't know why we got to go up to the door and get in a fist fight with somebody because their cars are parked everywhere. Why can't we just call the number and if they're supposed to be what, one hour response time to get that done? In the, the locations where those signs are up, then that absolutely is something we can and should be doing. So the places that the signs are not up, they need to be. That's a, another matter where we need to get with the property owner to get those signs posted. And we that was a part of our discussion this afternoon too. Okay, thank you. Mr. Marler, Lasco. Okay. As much as I sympathize with Ms. Ramswell, I think probably the, the problem exists in what we call them. We call them code enforcement officers or code enforcement. It's basically the same as a citizen's arrest kind of thing, if you want to go that way. Not having any law enforcement capacity, there's not much they can do except go out there and say, please move your car or please do this. And if they don't do it, then again, they have to call the sheriff's department and then they have to have somebody out there. And then what's to say as soon as the sheriff's department and our code enforcement people leave, they go back and park it again. The only other way around that is to, is, is and, I've, and as I said, I've talked to the city manager about this already, and I've mentioned this many times before that we need to look at the possibility of getting our code enforcement uh, officers um, in schooled in law enforcement that which which includes taking the police standards course and possibly having them you know and i hate to say it uh possibly our own police department or uh, we have the capability in our public safety uh, department to, to do some more enforcement on that there are there are ways to do it to give them but i mean then it's uh, i would be scared to go out there too you know if uh, if it's in the middle of the night and you got a bunch of drunk people and I might not be able to get to my phone faster than they can get to me. But I mean, you know, there's, there's ways to take care of it, and I understand Ms. Ramswell's frustration, but I wouldn't want to put any of our city uh, staff in jeopardy. Thank you, Ms. Marler. I'm gonna, we're going to call for a break here in just a second. I have one uh, thought. Uh, council members, um, what I think that might help here is for you to share your concerns with the city manager and the code department head. In, in private meetings uh, and come up with some ideas. And then when we go to, uh, to uh, call our special meeting to do, uh, to finish this ordinance, that maybe we can, uh, you guys can come up with an idea where we can actually set policy of how this court enforcement would take place within the ordinance itself. So I think we can address it at that time. Just, but, but to start the discussion, your frustration, Ms. Ramswell, uh, started with Lance and the department heads, and maybe you guys can come up with, with some policy solutions that we can put some teeth into this so Ms. Brown and, and the rest of the folks aren't as frustrated as they are because nothing seems to be done. We, we got to come up with some ideas outside of what the STR recommendations are. Ms. Brown, would you like to say one thing? We're going to move. We're going to take a break right after this. Promise, Mayor. But Ms. Brown, before you get started, Mayor, I guess Mr. Marler missed several council meetings because we did have two officer, two uh, code enforcement individuals that completed that course and passed de this past December. They could write parking tickets. I don't know if they quit or got fired or whatever, but we did send two of them, and they can write a ticket 
It actually goes to the that's, sheriff's department. That's not what I meant by that. They can write tickets, but they they have no other enforcement powers, and I've seen people rip tickets apart after they leave. Let's go, Ms. Brown. Um, I, there's just too much fake news here. Um, first of all, we, it's hard for us to rely on the sheriff's department. They are busy, and especially during the high season. And so it's the bot, you're at the bottom of the totem pole when you call in on some of these complaints. The other thing is, of all the pictures I sent, there was only one set that were nighttime. These aren't happening from midnight till 6 a.m. These are happening when I get out of bed in the morning from 6 till 5 p.m., which is when code enforcement should be on staff. And Mr. Marler, this whole thing, I was very well aware of it with uh, Clarice Lejeune. We had lots of meetings with her. There was never been a problem with our code enforcement officers where someone's life was threatened. I think that is crazy. It is Joey Fugioni had Crystal Beach under control. We didn't have any problems. Clarice, against what I believe was the right thing, pulled people off because she said, I'm putting them behind the desk because their lives are at stake. That is a fallacy. I am sorry. I cannot listen to that and, and justify that. And as far as um, you know, the code enforcement, part of the thing was we're going to raise these rental property rates so that we can hire more code enforcement. This is no longer a town where we've got from March till September people. My neighborhood was rocking all weekend. It was Atlanta weekend. This, is a, this has become a year-round issue. And this is so easy. And when the, we talked about the houses, when Rodney said about the houses, uh, isn't there a number? You can call so many of those houses, and there is no answer on the other end. People are thumbing their nose in this town to the residents. We'll work on that when okay. we pass this ordinance. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. All right, let's take a break, everyone. Five minutes. I promise no more than that.
gentlemen, please take a seat. Especially council members. Not to single you out. All right, everyone, have a seat, and we'll get this thing started. That little session, part of the session drug out. Let's see if we can't uh, be a, I don't want to say speed up, but just be a little more concise in our approach. <laughs> we'll help. I appreciate everybody's input. All right, we had one more person that wanted to talk. I kind of uh, prematurely closed the uh, public comment, so we'll call that last person up, and then we'll move right into the city manager report after that. Would uh, Mr. Ken Wampler, would you like to come up, sir? He was doing jumping jacks in the back. I just forgot to look up and recognize him. Thank you, Mayor, City Council, Ken Wampler, 310 Lower IP Loop. Um, I agree with Mr. Shelton and Mrs. Brown. I think the issue is code enforcement. The short-term vacation rental, there was a component in there that the City Council adopted, sent to code enforcement, and they should have been enforcing it. And I will tell you, I have firsthand knowledge that they did work nights and weekends during the season, and maybe we need to reevaluate that, which the uh, City Manager has stated, so I support that. The, the other thing that goes hand in, hand in hand with that is the vacation rental companies for the last two years went from paying $50 a year fee for registration to $250 a year. Where's that money gone? You know, I don't know if we're, we're, we're spending that money wisely if there's still a lot of own that get obviously inconvenienced during the weekends. So I would support that 100%. And then when the vacation rental ordinance went through, I believe collectively the discussion was let's get back on the docket, get the statistics relative to how many problems were reported and see if there's been an increase, a decrease, or if it's flattened out, because as you'll recall, I went through that exercise back in May, and I got the, uh, the uh, code enforcement statistics for the entire year and tallied them up by, you know, trash, parking, noise, all those categories, where they were relative to, is it vacation rental, or is it short, long-term leasing, or is it, is it full-time residence? We need to go through that exercise again, and if I need to do that, I don't mind doing it, but you know, let's, let's figure out where the problems are, because if it's still the same old problems that we've been dealing with for years, then it comes back to a code enforcement issue, and they don't have to have sheriff to make sure that, as an FYI, two of my properties got letters from code enforcement. They were doing their job. You know what they were? A stop sign wasn't exactly in the right spot, and I had, I had unfriendly turtle lights on a, on a uh, condominium balcony. Code enforcement. Absolutely right. We were wrong. But what about these other things that are inconveniencing the, the, the actual owner? So I support that. We're going to fix our violations, uh, no doubt about it. But I would ask that, you know, I mentioned this to Lance two weeks ago, we need to come back with the statistics of where, where the issues are, what the issues are, and if those issues are the same issues, trash, parking, and noise, then, then we need to figure out what we've done wrong because we've collected money to address these issues and we're still not doing it. That's my two cents. Thank you. I appreciate that. And seeing how we're really committed to finishing our ordinance and we want it to be a good one that actually affects the quality of life in all these residential areas and for the short-term rental people. Uh, maybe if you could hit work with Lance and seeing how you already compiled that information before, we might actually have something to compare with. So if as a willing citizen, uh, if you'd like to help Lance compile that information, that would help us make better decisions when we, do, when we come back together to finish this ordinance. And I appreciate your comments, Ken. Uh, we're going to move right on into the city manager's report. Uh, items 4C and E had been pulled, correct? So we'll go with A, B, D, F, and G, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, first item tonight is um, on October approximately the 20th of August um, council directed staff to have Tetra Tech provide a quote for um, redrawing the Captain Royal Melvin Heritage Park designs and they since have provided that quote to us in the amount of twenty seven thousand seven hundred and ninety dollars we are asking for direction from council if they wish to approve this quote 
then we will proceed. If they are not in favor, then staff is asking for additional direction on how they would like us to proceed. Thank you. Uh, first up, Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. I'm sure glad Mr. Dixon didn't make the comment of uh, if it didn't cost over 100000 because he made the comment that if it didn't cost over 30000 I believe it was Mr. Dixon, that uh, we would there's something we could do. So if it, he mentioned 100000 I'm sure it would have come in right under that. Um, I didn't know uh, what $4,200 for meetings. What, what, what kind of meetings are we having for $4,200? Does anybody know? Uh, they'll be um, similar to, to what they did in the uh, initial stages. They have to attend the meetings of the CRA Advisory Committee and the CRA uh, Board and, and City Council. And um, so they'll be present for those meetings to, to do the presentation. Right. Okay. Um, whew. Are you going to elaborate on that? Um, I, I, anyhow, that's just I, whatever. Um, thank you for that, David. Um, I, my personal opinion, I think they've rode the gravy train long enough, um, and I have unofficially uh, have been told that um, Jenkins can do this, finish it out, hundred percent ready to go, shovel ready, um, for close to this amount right here. Probably the same amount. The whole, the whole kit and caboodle. So, it, um, I would, um, I don't know if I need to make a motion to... I, I would really like for you to make one so we could do this in an orderly way. So if you okay. feel free, yeah, gonna, uh, take a shot at I'm it. Go ahead we'll go Mr. Braden. That Mr. motion to reject this and to... Uh, have staff uh, reach out to Jenkins out there or on our hey, Mr. Braden. Yes. Um, before we reach out to another party, we need to look into terminating our relationship with Tetra Tech. So if you can make your motion to direct your city attorney to look into terminating the relationship with Tetra Tech first. That'll be my motion. Okay. Second. I got a motion here. I got a second. Um, I guess we'll press on with the little guys that have signed up. Uh, Mr. Dixon, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Braden, for reminding me. I'm the one who said the 30000 I wasn't sure I was, but I, I knew you were probably right, and that was a mistake. I, I, I apologize for that um, because that's about what the price came in at, and, and, um, and I knew it when I said it as soon as it came out. I knew I shouldn't have, but I did, and, and um, anyway, um, I may have cost the city some money, but I apologize if I did. Um, my question is to uh, the city staff, uh, Mr. Campbell. Um, Mr. Campbell, could, could you complete this job? From an engineering perspective, I could complete the job. Uh, from a design, uh, landscape, architecture, I'm not qualified with those skills. Okay, if we did want to um, ask you to, one, to, to, to finish the design, and we did bring in some sort of a landscape architect of some kind to, to help us with that, you thinking that you could uh, finish this project? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be about uh, prioritizing uh, my time um, from a from a uh, professional standpoint, I have the capabilities of, of uh, engineering this project. Um, it'll, it'll strictly be uh, scheduling. Um, okay, the reason, reason I ask is, is that the, um, <clears throat> the city manager before, uh, the last city manager before she left, had made a statement to me that um, if you cleared your calendar for 30 days or something like that, that you might be able to get it done yourself. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm along with Mr. Braden here. I think we've, we've run this train as long as we need to. Um, I, I would like us to, one, either to um, look at having this done in-house to finish this thing up, or two, to maybe go to our continuous services contractor. But the continuous services contractor, I don't know if there is a price amount that we need to be concerned with as far as what we can actually just give to our continuous services contractor. So. I want to make sure that we're not bypassing a bid amount or anything like that, and our attorneys are going to check on that for us. But 
I just kind of want to know, can we, you know, can this be done in-house? And, you know, if we do go to our continuous services contractor and they give us a price and say, or whatever it may be, I just want to know, is it an option to do it in-house? So. It is an option to do it in-house. I mean, we're, we have the capabilities of, um, of uh, in civil engineering design uh, in our department. As I said before, we would have to... Uh, sub out uh, some of the uh, other items, landscape architecture and that type of thing. If, if it requires any modifications to the building, um, we would um, have to uh, hire an architect. Um, if there's any modifications to the building, um, uh, architecture, um, uh, mechanical engineering, um, electrical engineer, Everything that goes along with building design, we do not have those capabilities in-house. Okay, um, I just want to remind everyone that the motion on the floor is to terminate with Tetra Tech. So, so. Uh, no. I'm asking questions so I want to know whether or not. Right, right, right. No, no. Uh, I'm just saying for the next person that anyone that wants to weigh in, uh, I want to try to keep it along those lines. Let's take care of this first, and then we can. Move on to the second thing. I think, Mr. Mr. Jarvis, just real quick, the motion on the floor is not to terminate with Tetra Tech. It's to have the city attorneys look into terminating with Tetra Tech. I stand corrected. And Mr. Campbell, in the politest way possible, was like saying, don't make me really do this. <laughs> I got too much to do already. But we'll get to that bridge when we cross it, sir. Um, I got uh, uh, Ms. Ramswell and then Mr. Marler, uh, and then I'd really like to take this uh, motion to a vote, and then we'll move on to the next part of this. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I had a lot of comments specific to this particular estimate that they brought forth, but I won't go into that since we're now talking about the other aspect. Um, when we talk about, you're talking about bringing on an architect to have to do miscellaneous work. Wouldn't this just be CAD design at this point? Wh whoever took this project over um, and made modifications, um, uh, it, you would have to have an engineer uh, to do these things. It's not, it's not merely taking a set of plans that are designed and tweaking them. Um, the the um, uh, the engineer of record would ha number one would have to get permission to use another engineer's documents, um, and then uh, that engineer would take uh, liability for that design. So, do we know whether we signed anything in all the hundreds of thousands of dollars we've spent and all the millions of documents that we have with them? Have we signed anything that says that these plans are their exclusive property, or are they our property? They're our property. They're just not complete. So then we don't have to get permission to reuse them? If uh, We don't have to get permission, but if another engineer um, was paid to finish those drawings, he would have to get permission from Tetra Tech. To okay. use their that sounds to use sort their of drawings like double talk. Can somebody explain that to me? Because I'm we have not had a chance to review the documents that the city has executed with Tetra Tech. Um, I really think that if you want to explore terminating with Tetra Tech, you need to let us look at all these documents first, so we can answer these legal questions. Sounds good. And then I'll stop there. Thank. Thank you, Ms. Ramswell, Ms. Marlow. Help me refresh my memory as to what we are exactly wanting to redesign to begin with. I believe it was it had to do with the moving of the restrooms, changing of the uh, uh, the bandstand, uh, and um, the uh, switch the supposed switchbacks or something for the ADA compliance. Am I am I close? I'll I'll read um, from their scope of yeah. services. A sidewalk above the bluff grade shall be moved to minimally impact existing trees on the property or adjacent properties as determined by a licensed arborist. Bluffs shall be maintained and a ramp be designed into the project that is ADA compliant along the west property line from Harbor Boulevard to the Harbor Boardwalk, allowing for switchbacks running perpendicular to the bluff. 
bathrooms and the resource room included in the previously prepared design shall remain on the lower southern part of the property and the design revised to incorporate into the bluff. The bathroom and bandstand shall be designed to face due south and there shall, be, um, there shall not be any shade or canopy structures on either the east or west sides but only directly over the top of the bandstand. And uh, the fifth one is incorporate park elements identified by the client previously designed below the bluff to be above the bluff grade. Okay. Th this was based off the, the motion. Okay, uh, and the conversations I've had with you, uh, I know that we, we already, you and I had discussed the fact that the uh, way that the current elevation was designed, we didn't need the switchbacks because we had a gradual incline for ADA compliancy in the original uh, plans. And some of the other ideas were conceptual drawings that apparently that some people are going by and not the actual plans for the canopies. And I believe the bandstand that we were talking about on the top was actually you could turn the band either direction you wanted. You didn't have to have it facing no east, west, or north or south. Am I correct in that? Because I mean, I'm, I'm looking at what we originally because I, I believe I remember I was on the council when we originally did this, and some of those elements were not in there to begin with that were already done. Well, um, and then th this is the uh, these five items were voted on. Um, yeah, know, by I, re the, I remember by the that council, part, and that's why they're included in in their scope of services. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Cameron. All right. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and call this to a vote. We have a motion. We have a second. Can we? Yes, ma'am. We have both the chair and the vice chair of the Harbor CRA that help present and put this stuff together. Do, would do y'all have anything to add or any comments on what we're considering doing? Sorry, Mr. Mayor. That's all right, Jim. I just tried to get a vote here on it's whether right. we're going to look into terminating that contract. Uh, terminate the contract. I, I, I think that your staff uh, is very overwhelmed. I think you should look at a different avenue of, if you're not happy with this. I do think that $4,000 is a bit excessive for meetings. I think that uh, the license arborist should be removed because we know what the license arborist said. It was in the in the valley that was was not a conceptual drawing was part of the 90 percent plans and was elevations we know where the arborist said you could cut the trees to and we are not happy with that that's why we want the bluff stayed and uh and i just i think that you should move forward with somebody else other than uh the staff that's shorthanded over they got a lot on their plate right now and uh I appreciate it. And Mr. Dixon, you didn't say $30,000. That was a recommendation from our board to get you off that hook. <laughs> there you go. All right, everyone, let's go ahead and uh, take this to a vote. <laughs> Mayor, I'm going to go ahead and abstain. Okay, could you go ahead and... All right, eyes have it. So moved. Next. Thank you. Item B is resolution 18 37, which is our annual renewal of the agreement with the sheriff's office. We have Captain Nix and Mr. Farmer here available to answer questions. All right. We have a resolution for the law enforcement agreement. Could we start with a motion in a second and then we can have discussion? Anyone? What is it? Yeah, I'll, I'll make that motion. I move the council adopt resolution 18 37, accepting the FY 2019 law enforcement service agreement to provide law enforcement services to the city of Destin by the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office from October 1st, 2018. To September 31st, 2019. Second. Okay, we got a motion. We got a second. Thank you, uh, gentlemen. First one up, Ms. Ramswell. Well, while you have the microphone, is there anything you'd like to add to this particular 
resolution yeah. comment. Okay, thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Any questions for the gentlemen that are here? Go. All right, seeing none, let's go ahead and take this to a vote. Uh, the vote is unanimous, so moved. Thank you, Council. Sir, uh, item D. So, wait, can I go back to my question that I had regarding item A? I'm just one, I know we made the motion to go ahead and explore the possible termination of that contract. Do we need to make some other motion about what to do pursuant to that? We're not going to terminate it until we bring what we find back to the City Council at the next meeting. So okay. at so that point, you can do okay. whatever you want with the information. I just wanted to so. make sure that we had closed yeah. that. I, I, I kind of felt like it was anticlimactic, like, okay, but <laughs> well, all right. Well, and let me explain the reason why I really think the city attorneys need to look into it is because if you were to just terminate or reach out to a third party today, that could have unintended legal consequences that we're just not aware of at this point. So Understood. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. You're welcome. Um, now... Uh, item D. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, we have Ms. Jankowski and Mr. Buzz Eddy back with us this evening to discuss the future and next steps with regards to the city manager position. Mr. Eddy, would you like to be first? Would step up to the podium. Council direction. We advertised in several places for um, city managers, prospective city manager candidates to send in their letters of interest and resumes and you've got 55 responses i've gone through those and karen has gone through those and we think that given the qualifications that you published and the description that you all looked at um, we've got about 20 people that really meet the qualifications well i went through those and made a list of 20 and then over the weekend thinking that 20 was probably too many went through it and tightened it down what we need the council to do now is to go through those 55 and find the ones that best meet the qualifications in your opinion, because you're the ones that are going to have to work with the uh, future city manager. So if you will do that, look at the advertisement, look at the qualifications, look at the letters of interest and resumes that have been submitted, and develop a list of as many as you think you'd like to pull forward to the next step in this process. And what I would recommend to you is that you give those lists, each of your individual seven lists, to Karen and myself. We'll make a list for you and feed that back to you and say that these 10 each got a point, you know, and you'll get a point for each time a name appeared on each one of your lists. So the maximum somebody could have would be seven points. Minimum would be zero. So you might want to take the people that didn't get any points at all and shove them to the side and take some of the people that got five, six, seven points and start to develop a short list. I think you'll see some consensus develop. And when you have a list of people that got five points, six points, seven points, in other words, they were on five of your lists, um, then you'll be able to take the next step, which we recommend would be to interview those people by Skype or by uh, phone here in this chamber and just kind of get a feel for have them explain what's in their letter of interest and in their qualifications elaborate where you want them to elaborate and then maybe you can narrow it down from five or six to two or three or four and then when you get it to that point you might want to bring those people in as you've done before and Karen has shared that process with me that you've used before just bring them in for an afternoon bring them in for a day have some public interview process where you would ask them some questions, give the people an opportunity to meet with the public if that's what you desire to do, and then narrow it down to uh, somebody that you're willing to make an offer to. So <clears throat> do you want us to, out of the 55, each member make a list of their top 15 or 10? I mean, it's kind of up to you. I mean, I, I went through it the first time with kind of a, a broad comb, and I, I came up with 21 or 22, and Karen did the same thing. So then maybe I that'd be... Through, that's too many. Well, so then I went through it again over the weekend, and I came up with 11. That's a good number. 
Uh, some of you may be comfortable in going even farther down than that and saying, really, I like these five or these seven. So it's really kind of a what best fits your desire. It's, it's easier to work with 10, obviously, than it is 22. But you may not want to get to that point before you've had an opportunity to see what everybody else thinks. All right, I got some people that have some questions here. Uh, Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. I was told we had a committee with the city staff of like four or five members that were whittling this group down to like 10 members. Is that? I'm not familiar with that. I can speak to that. Um, the community development director candidates are being interviewed by a committee. Not We haven't established one for the city manager. OK. So you have bundled this from 55 down to 11. Karen and, Karen and myself have both, we've de developed our list. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean anything other than we wanted to be sure that we had some people within the 55 that met the qualifications. And I came up with 10, 22 the first time I went through it, narrowed it down to 10. And you know, what, I'm happy to provide you with that list if it helps you. What, what was the criteria? Did, did some of them just didn't meet everything that we'd put out the criteria for yeah they were yes, gone sir. first and then what was the yes sir to answer your question directly yes there are some that i don't believe met your qualifications now what i do as the florida city county manager's senior advisor for the panhandle what i do is i look for people that have had city manager experience in other places county manager experience i look for somebody that's got experience that's similar to what I think they need for the city of Destin. So they may have met the qualifications on a minimal basis, mm -hmm. but these 10 that I came up with, I think meet it best. And that's just an exercise I, I went through just for my own edification. And I'd be happy to provide you with that list, but I think it's more important for you to y'all mm -hmm. to develop a list. Now these 10 individuals, are they currently employed? Uh, some are, yes, sir, and some are not. Some are what we call in the business in transition. They've left from a city manager's position somewhere else because of a multitude of reasons, and they may be just looking for something. And there are others that are, that are working. OK. Um, another thing, too, is um, I know we talked about it before, but I would really like to meet with these individuals. We get down to like the last five, mm -hmm. meet with them one on one, um, you know, not, and not in a public setting. Um, I would, I would just want to put that out there. And I think the other thing that you pointed in your comment that made me think of it is that when you get down to five and you've got a consensus among the council that these five people are, are people that we want to bring in for an interview, it doesn't lock you in that you've got to hire one of those five. You can, just like hiring an engineer or hiring a consultant for some other business uh, operation, you can say, eh, we're going to go back to the list and pick somebody out on the list and bring them in. You're not locked in once you develop that five. And I think it's a great idea to meet with some of these folks individually. You can do that individually, but you and Dr. Ramswell could not do it together. Is that good, Mr. Braden? All right, Mr. Dixon. I, uh, I was kind of going to ask the same question as Mr. Braden, but um, maybe a little differently in that the, um, the people that the other 25 or 30 people that that have applied that basically that you've kind of already said maybe um, you put them aside a little bit and you got down to 22 or whatever it may be. Uh, th did these people just not meet the minimum qualifications that we had put out there? Or is that, um, and what I'm, my, I guess the reason I'm asking is, is that to reading 55 resumes, if, if we know half of those resumes don't even um, uh, qualify for the position, do we, you know, are we, I guess you still want us to look at them, but, I but I think you know more about what we're looking for as far as the job description that we put out there. And so if you think that they do not meet the minimum qualifications, you're kind of running this thing. And so I would have to agree with what your opinion is. So can I get a list of that 22 or whatever that you've came up with? I'd be happy to give you my list of 22 mm -hmm. and then I'll give you my list of 10. There you go. Over the weekend, what I did is just said, all right, 22 is too And many. it's nothing official. It's just yep. something that you've done. And I would just like to take a look at how you're grading it versus how I might But because because yeah. they're not on my list doesn't mean they don't meet the qualifications. I understand. It just okay. means that 
from my point of view, right. and from the Florida League of Cities, Florida City Managers Association, mm -hmm. I think these 10 are the best. I understand. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Dixon. Um, Ms. Ramswell. Thank you, Mayor. So I actually thought we were supposed to come with our abbreviated list tonight. That's great. If you did. So I have mine That's that great. I'm happy to share. At your, so if it wasn't supposed to be tonight, what is then our next time frame? What, what are we looking at from here on out? So just from an advisor that lives 50 miles away from here, I'm not going to say that you should have had it done and why didn't you do it. I just would ask you to get it done as quick as you can. And if you've done yours, great. And if we've got others that need more time, that's okay too. <clears throat> we'll try to get that as fast as we can get those done. And that's going to be up to y'all to say, okay, everybody, let's have this done by Friday. And we can do it by email or you can send a fax to me or whatever you want to do and to Karen. But if, if you want to take a little bit more time than that, you've all got other activities that you do, then set it for the October 15th meeting and have them all done by then. Do you guys want to speed that up and just do it the next meeting, 14, day, 15 days, 14 days from now? I, I really think this is going to be very difficult to try to accomplish at a city council meeting. I really think that we need to have a special meeting of some kind to discuss this. And because um, we're going to tie up a lot of time with this, I got a feeling. And, uh, and a special meeting, I feel like, would be the best way to handle this. And not just a workshop, but a special meeting where if we need to, we can vote. So that's just my opinion. Now, to get the ball rolling, to answer your question from earlier, Mr. Dixon, if the rest of the council, mayor and the council, are, are, would like to see my list, I'd be happy to email that out to, uh, through Karen to you tomorrow. Yep. That sounds good. It looks like everybody's nodding their head, so we'll go with that. Uh, Mr. Oberdeer. Okay. Um I mean, I thought it was pretty clear. I got the email from Karen. She gave me the list of, of everybody that applied, and she gave me your criteria, which I thought was a great uh, um, opportunity to just rank order people based on that criteria, mm -hmm. whether they'd been a city manager or county manager before, whether they had an advanced degree, whether they had, and what are their outside interests or what other outside committees or whatever they had been involved with. And it was pretty easy for me then to go through that and rank order. I mean, I've looked at resumes all my life. In fact, I taught a class in the Air Force on how to write resumes. And one of the things that I, that I saw in there that kind of impressed me was that there was a couple, there was at least one and maybe two that had been base commanders, which a base commander in the Air Force is the same as a city manager. And he put in there, base commander, city manager. And I gave him credit for being a city manager, just like I did some of the other ones. Right. But it was pretty easy for me to see that, there, I mean, there's some that were totally, like, I think I wound up with a, a potential of 20 points. So some of them got 20, some of them got 15, some got 10, some got five, some got zero. And, the, and I think I wound up with the top five, and I just sent you the list and I sent Karen the list. I, right. I thought that's what we were supposed to do. And I thought, and I, and I like your idea of, of whoever my top five were, they all get, they get a point. They get a point. And then whoever the other top five are from everybody else, they all get points. And that, that's how we come up with the, with the top five or seven or 10 that we want. Right, and you don't necessarily have to, or I, I would encourage you not to rank them at this point. Just say these these ten. I think we'd like to take to the next spot, and we'll give each one of them a point. But I'd like to see your list. I'd just I'd like to see, to, like to see how my list compares we're, with yours. It was pretty. It was that was close. <laughs> so we've had discussion about um, having a special meeting to to bring all this back together, or we can do it at the next council meeting. Which, what, which way do we want to? I, well, I think we all need to send in our list to Karen and to and to Buzz. And then maybe you report to back at us, I, maybe at the next city council meeting, to tell us who, who that well, who we might be in the top ten or whatever. We can uh, let's let's do it. We'll be on next city put it on the agenda for the next city meeting, and that's what we'll do. We don't need to make a motion or anything like that. Just have everyone have their list ready, or actually get your list done and send it uh, to Mr. Ed, and um, we'll go from there. And, and that way. When we get back together, our next city council meeting, we'll have we'll, we'll be able to refine that list and then set up our next action. Will be to set up the actual interviews after that. Does that sound good with everyone? Not okay. really with Sounds me. Good. I kind of agree with Mr. Dixon. I think we need a special. This this is something I don't want to. I, I know I only have a year, about a year or so left on here, but and I'll get to the other part later. But I think this is something that's going to require us to have a special meeting. Well, I, I, by putting it on the next agenda, we're already past. 
No, I, I, th here. I, I think bringing, bringing the, top, the top people at the next meeting, when we have the interview through Skype, that will be where we do the special meeting because now we're down to brass tacks at that point. I don't think we need a meeting, a special meeting before that. Let's get to the top five to where we actually want to talk to them, and then we can have that. We can have a meeting specifically for that. Well, my only heartburn is that's what we did the last time, and we only had that person for two, two a little over two years. So, I think, I think, Mr. Councilman, that is a that is a good interview question to say, because some of these folks have moved every two years, and that's a good interview question is to say. What are your intentions? You know, do you intend to be here two years and look at this as a stepping stone to your next position, or is it something that you want to put in roots and stay here for the long haul? Thank you, Mr. Eating. Appreciate it. All right, uh, back to the city manager report. Item F. Did you have a comment? Yes, if you don't mind. Uh, thank you for your time. I appreciate you guys helping us work through this. Um, I did want to point out one uh, thing that might be of just procedure, uh, but the mayor uh, wanted to make sure that council was on board with having the mayor provide a list or not. I know normally the mayor position doesn't have a vote, but I just want to make sure we we're on the same page on that one if, if we could address it. I didn't make a list. <laughs> <laughs> so you're no, bailing me out if I don't have to, but I will I just don't have an be part of the, the discussion. Being involved. We let the previous mayor be involved. I think we should allow uh, Mayor Jarvis to be involved. Yeah, I support the mayor having a development and a list so he can participate in discussion. I just want to make sure we were all on the same page on that one because I knew it was before and not, and I didn't want it to be where you provided the list and then you were kind of put in an awkward position. So I didn't even plan on it, so I thank you guys if you want to weigh in. Yeah, in other words, misery loves company, right? <laughs> All right, well, I'll participate in the exercise. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Item F is with regards to 108 Cybert Avenue, a prospective purchase. And what staff would like direction from council on is um, we, we've got an appraisal on the property at 250000 but we would like council's permission to enter into negotiations um, with regards to this property and bring back to council for approval what we feel is the best deal. And this would be in direct cooperation with the city attorney. Go ahead. So moved. I have a second. Second. I have a second. No further discussion. Let's take a vote. Unanimous eyes have it. So moved. Uh, item 4G. Thank you again. A uh, few updates and announcements. On Thursday, October the 25th, the city will hold its annual open house at the Destin Community Center. Uh, we invite the public and all of council to attend if possible. Um, we, I'm sorry, my technical difficulty here. Had a brief conversation um, with the public works director for the county. Um, they're looking at potentially expanding parking at the James Lee Park in the future and wanted just to let us know to be aware that they're looking at that. And we all know that Crystal Beach area desperately needs additional parking. So um, that's just a heads up on that. Apologize for the delay. I've been experiencing some interesting things with my computer this evening. <laughs> uh, we had um, an inquiry from the CRA committees um, with regards to having the city attorney attend these meetings. Um, I can tell you that in the past, the city attorney did attend CRA meetings, the advisory meetings. Um, I can tell you that I believe it was when the market had the downturn and we were trying to shave as much expense off 
that we discontinued that. And now with the request from some of the advisory committee members, I'm bringing it back so that I can get some guidance as to if you would like the city attorney to attend these meetings. Skip. So is that for all the committee meetings or just the ones that have requested him or? Um, this was specifically for the two CRA advisory committee meetings and we could expand it however far you wanted to. Lance was, here we go, I'll just. I believe the uh, the CRAA boards have been requesting it, or at least the Harbor one for a while, that one of the city attorneys attend, because they kind of asked me one time, why weren't you at the last meeting? That was a couple months ago. And then uh, the only board I've identified that really needs an attorney, Skip, to answer your question, besides that board, just because they're asking about it, is the Harbor and Waterways board. They they actually do all quasi-judicial hearings, is what we just found out, because we were, we were requested, requested to attend two of those meetings. And it ended up being uh, both of them were serious quasi-judicial matters involving some pretty high-end properties, and and they 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 really needed guidance because they were not running them how typical QJ should be done. And so, they, at least in in the interim, till they learn how to do them on their own, they probably need some training. That's the only board I've thought of besides the Harbor CRAA, which asked. Uh, Jeff, what about uh, the Board of Adjustments? Because that's quasi-judicial as well. We, we already attend that. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Ms. Kopp attends those too, along with us. So. Do we need a motion here, for, or do you just need some direction? I, I'll go and do a motion, just because uh, it looks nice and black on those minutes when, when you make the motion and the vote, ultimately, so someone can refer to it two years from now if all of us are gone. So. I'll, I'll make that motion. Okay, we have a motion to include a, um, the city attorney at the um, uh, CRA board meetings, uh, both Harbor CRA. It's up to you about the town center. Uh, and it, it, town we've only center been requested CRA? about the Harbor CRA board, to, to my knowledge. Uh, the town center is yeah, not I, requested. I thought Harbor. it was just, Jeff just said the Harbor CRA and the Harbor and Waterways board. Those are the only two I know of. Third. Okay, that's your motion? Yeah. Okay, we have a motion. Second. You have a second. Any further discussion? Eyes have it so moved. <clears throat> Anything else, Lance? Just oh. a couple of more announcements. Um, the 18th annual Fall Festival will be held at the Destin Community Center on Monday, October the 29th. If you've never had the opportunity to attend, uh, Miss Lisa and her crew do a wonderful job converting our community center into a uh, Halloween but friendly environment for the kids um, that they, they love. And hundreds, literally hundreds of kids are coming in there every year. So if you've never had the chance, I, I, would, I would recommend it. Um, the time on that one, Lisa? Five to eight. Five to eight. Also on November the 3rd, that's a Saturday, we have our annual Pinfish Classic. That's for kids 12 and under. If you'd like to volunteer, I'm sure the Parks and Rec Department can put you to good use out there. Um, it is a, a very fun event, very well liked by um, our local youngsters. So if you can attend that also, I would encourage you to do so. Um, on, the, on Friday, November 16th is the 12th annual Holiday Craft Show at the Community Center. Um, it also runs on Saturday the 17th, so just mark your calendars for those items if you would. And lastly, I was going to ask Ms. Jankowski if she wanted to give a brief update on where we were at with the um, planning director search. Good evening again. Just wanted to give you an update. Um, also, Lance has been involved in every step of this process, so He's working real closely with um, and involved uh, as well. So we have interviewed five candidates, and uh, two are from the state of Florida. One is from Georgia, one is from South Carolina, one is from Arkansas. Uh, those were all conducted by Skype, so it was nice to uh, work through that. Technology was kind of uh, troublesome with some of them, but uh, we got it all worked out. Um, so the next step is uh, I've requested background check information from all of those individuals as well as assessments 
the ass assessments are really comprehensive. They also give us another um, good avenue to look at besides the Skype interview. It does personality, job analysis. We're waiting on one of those from the last candidate. So once we receive that, the team is going to get together, including Lance, and uh, review all of those and potentially narrow down the candidates uh, maybe to three or four. Uh, but we haven't really decided um, yet because we're waiting on that last assessment to see how they all pan out. And then um, we would uh, like to do a ranking of those individuals so we know what top candidate, second in line, that kind of thing. But um, with that, we would like to schedule um, uh, in-person interviews with the, the team, the interview panel. That would also include a meet and greet. It sounds like there was some consensus from council from at the previous meeting that um, some of you would like to actually meet these individuals. So I would like to know if you can let me know either tonight or by email what dates are not good for you this month or, or so forth. So if you're out of town or on vacation. So I don't schedule that in-person interviews with the interview and the meet and greet so you're available to actually be there. So if you could... Can we do a doodle poll? Can, can you exercise, do that with a doodle poll where we could poll everyone? What yeah, that's were? fine. If you just give me some dates that are not good. So this is absolutely don't schedule at this date, but I'm available potentially the rest of the time. November 7th through the 13th for myself. Going hunting, are we? Week of October fifteenth. All right, um, Lance, let's do, uh, you got your consent agenda. Need a, a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Motion um, to approve. Second. Got a motion with a second. Any discussion on any item? Seeing none, let's vote. Eyes have it, so moved. All right, we're going to move on to item seven, and we will start all the way to the left hand side with Mr. Braden. You got a consent agenda. We just did it. You just voted on it. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, the only one I have tonight is it was brought to my attention a couple days ago that. Uh, apparently two of the businesses in town, pontoon boat rentals companies, have not completed their application and paid their dues in the, in the past two years since this was adopted. The livery vessel ordinance. Um, city manager, do you know if this is true or not? I do not, but I'll certainly find out if you can provide me any additional information that, that would be helpful. I can do that. The, the ones you. that uh, have not um, come in compliance with that yet. Um, and I'd really like to know if it's true. Why? Why, why has staff allowed this to happen for two years when everybody else has been paying their dues? That, that's, some of them are upset because they've been paying their dues and this group's just uh, letting the slide. Um, and that's all I have tonight, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Braden. Ms. Ramswell. I actually have nothing tonight. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Ramswell. Uh, Mr. Dixon. Uh, I only have one thing. I attended the Public Works Public Safety Committee meeting um, last month. And um, I, um, <clears throat> uh, I asked the committee to look at the airport road curve in a little maybe different light. Um, I, I hope I didn't overstep my bounds, but 
but basically I attended the committee meeting and asked them to look at some ways that we might could expedite the fix that we need to have on the curve at Airport Road. Um, they're supposed to be doing some checking for us and maybe come back and report to us of some kind, a way that we can possibly get that curve fixed a little bit faster than what we got it scheduled for. So um, they were great to work with and, and uh, had a very good productive meeting. And, and so there may be some ways that we can do something to expedite it. So I, I, you know, ride my bike by there all the time. And I was thinking, you know, especially some of the places I go up in Alabama on some of the more treacherous tees or turns, they use rumble strips to kind of wake you up slow you down let you know you're about so i don't know if that's in consideration or not but well that was talked about um but it is a noise factor and you know and there is some homes in there but you know there is some ways that you can do some different kind of paving or maybe even some um you know some roughing up the paving to, to and then some guardrails of some kind inside the lane and the outside lane to keep the cars from one going into the other lanes of traffic and two to keep them you know within the same area anyway not skidding out of control so uh, they're going to be looking and come back and see what they can come up with thank you mr dixon mr over there nothing on that mr mayor mr marler um i'm pulling what i had for tonight uh, so i have nothing else mr destin thank you mayor um i will be as brief as possible and i'm trying not to kick the uh the hornet's nest too much since this will be slightly controversial i know people will have opinions on one side or the other but i brought up solutions to the private pay to park and the traffic congestion because um while some may disagree what the source of the problem is but um at the end of the day i've received a tremendous amount of uh members of the public outcry with regards to the pay to park uh, scheme that's been put on the Emerald Grand property uh, that has caused spill out of the line queue out onto Highway 98 and then onto uh, portions of the bridge. And um, of course, the first inclination of most members of the public is to tap into some of the vitriol that exists towards that, that, um, uh, towards that development and, um, and just you know, encourage me and others to pass just a flat out ban on a pay to park, which I don't think is appropriate. I'm going to, tr I'm trying to find a common ground that allows them to do what they want with their property, but not impact the general uh, welfare and safety of the, the public. So my solution um, with regards to, uh, to the problem is to uh, explore a requirement that rather than um, money being collected on the front end, that it actually be collected on the exit. And the theory is, of course, aligning with basically most professional parking um, solutions and infrastructure that basically everybody collects the money on the exit rather than the entrance. And if that was enshrined as a requirement, that might lend um, a lot of, uh, lend itself to, to allowing um, those properties that want to charge for pay to park uh, the ability to continue doing so but not to impact the public in a negative way because we just simply can't have those cars queuing up on the thoroughfare we're going to hurt somebody so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll allow anybody uh, I, i'm, I'm going to yield to let anybody else discuss mr mr destin uh my employer is uh, exploring those possibilities and also mr I, i'm going to ask mr campbell to address a situation that we're working on also go ahead mr campbell we we've been in contact with um with the representative uh, of DOT uh, and requested that a right turn lane uh, be included in the 3R project into their main entrance. Uh, they, they already have a right turn lane coming off the bridge going into their, second, their secondary entrance, the first entrance you come to off the bridge. That's already programmed into the 3R. Um, so they're meeting this week. DOT and we should have an answer this week whether or not uh, we can get a, uh, a right turn lane installed at that intersection at that signal uh, Mr. Destin I like uh, that suggestion I think that's something we probably ought to look into in the city public parking areas as well uh, the same idea where you get a ticket when you walk you go in and you pay on the way out uh, a kiosk or, or something along those lines. I think that makes a heck of a lot more sense than what we're doing right now. 
Well, to a certain degree, we, we still do it. You park and then you download the app. You're no longer in queue waiting to get into the parking lot. So we have it in, in place. You, you set up the app, you, get, you pay, and then um, it'll start the timer, and then you pay on your exit. So whether or not there's going to be a line queue needs to happen on the internal portions of the private lot and not spill out on the thoroughfare. Um, so that's, that's my general thought on it. Um, I may yield the issue for, for a couple weeks and allow the Florida Department of Transportation to give us an idea on the turn lane, but I, and, and furthermore, if, if Mr. Marler can come back with what his uh, employers might have as a solution to keep all of that internal, uh, I'd be happy to hear it because I'd rather them f solve their own, their own issues um, and give them that opportunity rather than just straight legislate, but it's something that has to be dealt with and it has to be dealt with before the next season. I will, oh. do, I will do my best to do that, but also I will, I will address the fact that we did not start this until other um, uh, properties were also doing it. Um, Lance, could you put, put that as part of your city manager report at the next meeting? Once you find out from Ms. Campbell what the FDOT has come up with, make, just make this particular subject part of your uh, city manager report. Yep, we'll do it. Go ahead, Mr. Dixon. Yeah, just so we're aware, that's not the only property that this is going on on. So, yeah, that's yeah and, and so, you know, when we do this, we need to make sure we're not singling out a property, that we make sure that we do it for all the properties right. that are doing it. Because there, there is others that I have seen causing problems. Right, yeah. and I think one of the issues is that everybody just has jumped into the collecting money for parking game and they're treating it like we do with the booster club on the Friday night, collecting money for parking at a football game where you get the money on the front end rather than on the back end. It makes a lot more sense. If you're going to do it permanently, do it on the back end when the people are leaving the lot. So if we can get everybody in compliance with that, maybe it won't be necessary for an ordinance. We might need to do the same thing. Yeah, and, and I actually see valet parkings created some of that in certain oh, places as yeah. well because they start stacking up and the poor guys are running back and forth. Another, so. another issue that, that, that happens on our property is, and happens on other properties is, is your, and part of that reason I think is possibly caused by the city boardwalk in a sense, is that they're not necessarily going to that particular property's uh, amenities, they're going to other uh, well, in our case, uh, there might be somebody that's parking there to go to AJ's in, in our parking lot instead of parking there to go to one of our restaurants. Somebody parking at AJ's coming to one of our restaurants. And so that's one of that's some of the issues is they're not actually using the using our parking, uh, those parking lots for the, you know, the particular businesses that are in that parking area. So Kyron, I don't think we're trying to um, pass blame or anything. We're just trying to. Oh, no. Well, I'm, I'm not trying to pass blame. I'm just issue. saying that is. That is, that is uh, the result of the fact that the boardwalk is working, in a sense. Well, I think, Lance, make that part of your report. David will work with FDOT, and then uh, after we get that report, then Mr. Desson, if you feel we need to make a motion and start a process to legislate some type of rulemaking, then we can at that time, if that makes you happy. Good. Sounds good. All right, Mr. Uh, are you done? Go ahead. So, um, Mr. Campbell, I have a question about the parking and the impact. I know with every development, there must be a traffic impact study done, especially a development of that nature. Was there one done before it was built? And then shouldn't there have been one done after the completion of the major phases? And was that done? There's... Um There is a traffic study done um, for each individual uh, project that we have, and it shows the impacts on the, on the highway. Um, it was done for this project. Um, it hasn't been redone. It was just done initially. Um, that, that shows the, um, uh, it's a, a peak hour analysis that um, there's currently at the current level of service we have on on Highway 98 is a level of service D, and it it has um, uh, available peak hour trips on there. And if your development doesn't exceed that, then you're allowed to uh, continue to develop. So aren't they due for another one, particularly since there is another phase that they have 
positioned as being potentially developed? I'm not sure how that was initially uh, analyzed. That, that additional phase may have been analyzed along with the original development, but we can sure, sure, certainly look at that to see if that, that next phase um, uh, needs, a, needs another traffic analysis. Because I think we can all certainly agree there has been a significant impact, and if there is additional development there, there will be catastrophic <laughs> almost impact. So, yeah, I would appreciate you looking into sure. that. All right. Thank you. Mr. Morgan. Nothing tonight. Thank you. All right. Mr. City Attorney, stand in, I guess. Nothing for us. Meetings adjourned. I had a lot Mr. to say. <laughs> no, I didn't. Speak up or forever hold your peace. Oh, this is not a wedding. <laughs> <laughs>